Today we're going to be covering the entire Nightwing soft reboot that happened recently. It's going to be containing issues 78 all the way to 105, and you have found yourself at the Comic Storian channel, where I take comic books, I combine them into an audio drama, and you get the full run of the entire story. And if you enjoy this one, I highly recommend going to your local comic book store or local bookstore and adding it to your collection. Now, Nightwing had a bit of a choppy run from issues 1 through 77, but that's when Tom Taylor came in and created a brand new soft reboot, a brand new beginning for Nightwing, which is what we're covering today. This run ran until issue 105, where Tom Taylor didn't quit, but we started another soft reboot, The Dawn of DC. All of this is still actually in full continuity. It's just the publishing lines where they want to make you think it's brand new. Either way, this is issue 78 to 105, and it tells the story of Nightwing beginning his new journey, his entire new friendships, all of his buddies. Here we go. Gotham Heights Park. A long time ago, there were a group of boys bullying someone. There was a young girl who tried to stop them, but one of the boys was Shelton Lyle. Shelton was a very privileged kid, perfect teeth, wealthy family, but it wasn't just the attention of the girls that the boys got. It also struck a chord with the young Dick Grayson. By this time, Dick had already lost his parents to Tony Zuko, so there really wasn't anything that could hurt him. Shelton commented that he saw the last act of the Flying Graysons at the circus and said that it was the greatest show that he had ever seen. But that didn't faze him. Dick stood his ground telling Shelton to leave these kids alone. Shelton took a swing, but Dick, being rather nimble for his size, used it and easily headbutted Shelton without so much as taking his hand out of his pockets. Of course, this led to a brawl, which now also brought the attention of the police. Shelton asks if they know how much trouble they're going to be in. His dad owns the cops! And the little girl asks, Do you really think that they'd listen to you over me? What do you think, dad? And behind the little girl is Jim Gordon. Jim brought Dick home and little Barbara was amazed that he lived in a castle. Thought that the lack of dragons and a moat was a little disappointing though. As Dick went inside of Wayne Manor, Jim explained to Alfred what had happened, and Dick started to quietly wash the dishes, with Alfred stopping him. Why are you doing my job? Dick says that even if it was, he still wants to help. Alfred then begins to dry the dishes, stating that he heard that there was a fight, and that he fought three other students. Dick says that there was a kid, and the others were hurting him. I'm sorry. Alfred laughs, telling him that Master Bruce may feel the need to wear a costume to be a hero. But I am glad that Dick Grayson stood up when someone else was in need. It takes a different hero to help out without a mask. Now we go to the current times, 2021, and a group of college students run after a small dog throwing rocks and kicking it. Gotham has a madness in it, but this is Bloodhaven. These people are just cruel. After kicking the puppy one last time, Nightwing steps through the fog, stating, Usually I'd open up with something disarming and witty. But I'm not usually this disgusted. One of the men from the group yells that they were just having some fun, and Nightwing asks, Your idea of fun is torturing small animals? You really need to broaden your horizons. The student reaches into his jacket, pulling out a gun, stating, Well, I guess the fun is over! And he points it at the dog. Nightwing bats the gun away with his baton, and he starts to take down the group, stating, I am not going to let you shoot a puppy in the head. And in his experience, the next thing is the dog waking up without its memories, driving a cab. With or without amnesia, a dog shouldn't be behind the wheel of a car. As the college students run away, Nightwing takes off his glove and he holds it out to the puppy, telling it that he isn't going to hurt it. The dog growls and bites his hand. Nightwing picks her up and pets her. That's okay. Let's just get you to the vet so that I can go to the doctor. But meanwhile, elsewhere, Blockbuster holds a secret meeting with the mayor of Bloodhaven. As Blockbuster waits, the mayor says that he does have office hours and an office. Meeting at night under a bridge feels like a way to attract trolls. Commissioner McLean opens up a briefcase of paperwork and Blockbuster says that a number of his businesses have already been stagnating. The council president, Melinda, looks at the paper asking if he has spreadsheets, really putting the organized in the organized crime. Blockbuster tells her not to pretend to be shocked by a well-run operation. And the mayor asks, why are we out here? What do you expect me to do? Blockbuster tells him that he is expecting him to do as he was told. And you have failed. As the mayor begins to ask what would he have had him do, Blockbuster grabs him by the head, telling him, We are having this meeting so that you can be made an example out of. He begins to apply a bit of pressure, and the mayor's skull cracks. 
He then begins to clean the blood from his hand, stating that the mayor's body will be found. As council president, you will be next in line. Your job will be to serve the city, and I am the city. Do we have an understanding? Melinda tells him that, Melinda tells him, of course, and Blockbuster goes on stating, I spoke to your father. He's a killer, but he is not a liar. I understand that you are estranged, but Tony spoke highly of you. Congratulations, Mayor Zuko. Back with Nightwing, he heads home after a visit to the vet, and then to the doctor when he notices something strange. He owns the apartment block where he lives, paid for when he had Wayne money, but he's quickly running out of funds. But something's wrong. There's someone in his apartment. Without giving him a chance, Nightwing suits up, jumping through his own window, but is quickly thrown against the wall. As Nightwing lays upside down against it, he looks up, and Barbara says, surprise. And if you're going to operate as a superhero out of an apartment, you need better security. You might have some cutting edge stuff, but anyone with years of experience trespassing and advanced defense disabling technology wouldn't have a problem. There is something I need to tell you though, Dick. Before she could continue, she hears a bark and asks, what's that? And as Nightwing brings the dog in, Barbara screams, stating, oh my God, it's so adorable. Welcome to your forever home, little girl. Nightwing says that this is not her forever home, but Barbara tells him that once he brought this thing through the window, it became her forever home. Just accept that you have a fur baby now. But as to why I'm here, as Oracle, I was chosen to be the executor of Alfred Pennyworth's will. While you were not yourself, Dick, a lot has happened. You should take a seat. A few moments later, Nightwing looks at the laptop and says that it has a lot of zeros. He was... Barbara tells him, yeah. Alfred was a billionaire who liked to make sandwiches for those he cared about because he wanted to. She then takes out a letter, handing it over, stating that this might also help explain a bit. She didn't open it. As Nightwing sits, he opens up the letter and begins to read a letter from Alfred to him. Alfred said that he knew leaving his fortune to him would be a bit of a shock. But as Master Wayne's legal guardian, he was given a large amount of Wayne Industries stock, as well as a ludicrous amount of wealth he never had a need for. He invested much wisely in places that it would do the most good, which, in fact, he planned on coming to him for. Like Bruce, his mind is astonishing. He can think in ways no one else can. He is a problem solver and the world is full of problems. There would be no one better to leave this fortune with. Just know that he does believe in Dick Grayson and that he knows that the world will be a better place with more people like him wanting to help those in need. And above all, though they rarely say it out loud, he was very proud to call him his son. Meanwhile, in Upper Bloodhaven, Belinda comes home and her bodyguard asks, how did it go? She begins to wash her hands from the blood transferred from Blockbuster's handshake, stating that she is now the mayor. And the bodyguard asks if she's ready for this, and Melinda says she is. She is not, however, ready for him. The bodyguard says that she can't wait long. She may not get another chance. And Melinda looks at the poster of the Flying Graysons, a Nightwing specifically circled. And she says that he knows. Soon. Nightwing has spent his entire life working without a safety net, because he always had someone to catch him if he fell. First it was his parents, then his father, then his other father, then his friends, and then his brothers. Everyone needs someone to catch them when they fall, someone who makes them feel safe. But while Nightwing's new dog passes out from eating too much food, he looks at her empty bowl and says that he kind of wonders what it tastes like. Babs says that she's going to guess he hasn't eaten yet, so Nightwing tells her, Nope, come on, I know a nice place nearby. So a short while later, they're at a 24-hour pizza place. Nightwing orders two slices, and Babs asks, Really? You're a billionaire now. And Nightwing then decides to order four slices. But as they get their pizza, Nightwing says that there's a statue that he wants to show her. So the two head to the park, with the statue of a man fighting a giant sea creature. Nightwing says that Bloodhaven started as a small whaling town. This fountain was built back when people in the city believed that they could take on monsters and win. And as they sit, and they look in silence. Babs looks over, asking if he's okay. He's unusually contemplative today. Nightwing says that he forgot who he was, and Babs tells him, well, sure. He was kind of shot in the head. Can't really fault him for forgetting who he was. Nightwing then asks, what did he leave behind, though? What did he create that kept going when he was gone? What's so heroic about punching bad guys and then waiting to punch more? Babs says that there's more to it than that. He has saved lives, and pretty sure that he saved the world more than once. And it's not like he has confidence issues, he wears the tightest costume out of everyone in the group. Nightwing sighs. He looks down and he contemplates, again, I just, I want to do more, Babs. With everything that Alfred left me, I kind of can. I'm just not sure where to focus this. 
Bab says that he's one of the world's greatest problem solvers. So she's pretty sure that he'll work it out. But while the two begin to eat their pizza, a man with his son says that he's sorry to bother, but would they happen to have some spare change? Bab says that she really doesn't carry cash, and the man says that that's okay. Most people don't these days anyway. And Nightwing stops, and he stares for a moment. Hey, wait, let me buy you some food. Like, lots of food, and whatever else you need. And invite friends, really, anyone who could use a meal. Don't hold back. So, a short time later at the pizza shop, the street is filled with all of Bloodhaven's drifters that could go for a bite to eat. Three young kids ask if it's okay to take theirs to go, and Nightwing tells them of course. The man from before says that he can't thank them enough, and Nightwing smiles. It's really nothing, Martin. But as Nightwing gets ready to set up a hotel room for them, he notices that his pocket is a little lighter. He looks around and says, I think those kids stole my wallet. Don't tell Batman. Babs laughs. <laughs> Too late, it's already in the group chat. Nightwing stares as his phone begins to ping rapidly. And as they leave, Babs says, you might want to put that on silent. Cass has no self-control when it comes to emojis. But while Nightwing heads out to go back and get his wallet, Martin and his son begin to walk home when someone tells them that that looks like some good pizza. Martin asks the person if they'd like a slice and the figure tells them that it's more of a stab than a slice that he's after. Tell the kid to run. As an arm with a strange looking gun creeps out of the shadow, Martin tells his son, uh, Elliot, go back to the pizza shop and stay there. Everything's going to be okay. Once Elliot is gone, the person tells him, no, it's not going to be okay. Martin tells the person, please, I don't have anything. But the figure says, you have exactly what I'm looking for. As the trigger is pulled, a small mechanical arm shoots into Martin's chest and then quickly retracts. Martin looks at the fist-sized hole in his chest and the figure tells him, You had a heart. Elsewhere, Babs guides Nightwing towards the tracker that was in his wallet when she tells him to stop there and look around. He stands on top of the building looking into the crowd when he notices Salvatore Moroni meeting with a woman. Unknown to Nightwing, the woman that Moroni is meeting is actually Melinda Zuko, the soon-to-be new mayor of Bloodhaven. But while the two discuss their business, Nightwing sees the three kids from before walking by, spotting a wallet on the table, and one of them quickly pockets it. As Moroni's men catches them, they pull out their guns and they begin to run. But Nightwing rushes down, knocking them out. As he's going down, Nightwing tells Babs, You know, we could have avoided all of this if we just stayed in and tried the kibble. Babs tells him, Nah, this is far better. You can't beat the combination of pizza and taking out overconfident goons. Also, the wallet stopped three blocks back under the Nugent Bridge. Go after the kids, I'll call the police. As Nightwing jumps down onto a passing truck, he tells her that there's no point. They're Moroni's people, they won't even be charged. Babs tells him that those men were about to kill children. She's still calling. But while she does that, Nightwing hurries over to where the signal last pinged to find a tent city for the homeless people. But by the looks of it, a tent city where no one is over 16. As all of the children look at Nightwing, one of them asks if he is the man without a heart. Please don't hurt anyone here. Nightwing tells her, no, I, I'd never. Sorry, just keep whatever it is you took. You need it more than me. A short while later at Nightwing's apartment, Bab says that he was right. The police did nothing. She has no idea how he can put up with this place. She then asks if he even got his wallet. He tells her no, but he knows what he wants to do with his money. And that is to be a safety net for this city. He wants to catch who's ever fallen in Bloodhaven. As the dog sits by the door, wagging its tail, there's a knock at the door, and someone says, Mr. Grayson, police, we'd like to have a word. Maywing hurries over, opening it up. Sorry, I was asleep. And the detectives tell him that it's five in the afternoon. Did he have a late night? Maywing pauses. What is this about? The other detective says that he reported his wallet stolen last night, canceled all of his cards. Well, before reporting his card stolen, a hotel was booked for Martin Holt. Maywing says, yeah, that was me. Martin didn't steal my wallet. Hopefully you didn't have any trouble at the hotel. The detective says, well, yeah, but Martin never checked in. He was found murdered this morning. This causes a bit of shock for Nightwing. What? What about his son, Elliot? Is he okay? The detective says that they don't have any information about a son. Interesting that he does. Just down the street, Barbara answers her phone asking, what, missed me already? And Nightwing tells her that it's something like that. Could she come back? Pretty sure he's being accused of murder and she's his alibi. After getting dressed, he puts on some coffee and the detectives state that Mr. Holt was found dead this morning. His heart was removed. You don't know how, do you? 
He sits up asking, why would I know? The detectives tell him because he paid for the hotel for Mr. Holtz. They don't want to theorize about why, but they're thinking that he didn't like a proposition and something went wrong and he cut out his heart. Just like he'd been taking the hearts of homeless people all over the city. That's when there's another knock at the door and Barbara walks in asking how's it going. And Nightwing tells her, you know, I'm being accused of murder. How about you? She takes a seat and says, hello, my name is Barbara Gordon. I was with Dick Grayson all night. I have a GPS on my phone and I'll be happy to show you our movements for the last 24 hours. The detective tells her that they understand, but what is her relationship to this man? The two look at each other. Nightwing tells her, I've been wondering that myself. She says that she tells them that that's not relevant. And the detective tells her that they will decide what's relevant or not. This is a murder investigation. Barbara says, really? Because I have a law degree. Now we're both eager to help with your investigation, but if you're accusing Mr. Grayson when he has an alibi and there's absolutely no direct evidence linking him, that would be embarrassingly incompetent. With nothing else, the detectives leave and Nightwing says that they've got to find Elliot. But what's more though, is that the killer cut out Martin's heart. Yesterday, when he chased the kids into the tent city, they asked if he was the man without a heart. Barbara says that she'll start going through the police records to try and find out anything useful. So Nightwing suits up and says that if his hunch is correct, they're going to need more specific help. Later, as he's heading up to the rooftop, Tim Drake says that Batman wanted to give him something and hands him a wallet with a chain on it. Nightwing looks at Tim. I'm not going to live this down, am I? And Tim tells him, of course not. They go inside of the apartment and Tim asks, did you get a puppy? And Barbara tells him that Dick said that she was going to the pound. And Tim laughs, yeah, likely story. So are you supposed to take the dog on the missions? Nightwing tells him, yeah. And Tim asks why. Well, people are more approachable with a lovable dog, but also she needs a walk. So later Nightwing gets into position above the tent city while Tim blends in below walking the puppy. After an hour, Tim radios back that he managed to find Elliot, but Elliot seems content staying there with the others, says he feels safe. He did mention that his father was killed by a man without a heart though, and he isn't the only one. Too many kids in there have the same story. Nightwing tells him, all right, hurry up. We have trouble walking in. Brutale and Alexicutioner just showed up. One of the kids asks, what do they want? And Brutale says that the people here have been stealing and that's a crime. A cut of every crime in the city goes to Blockbuster, no matter how pathetic. We bend the rules for homeless kids and Blockbuster will look weak. And Blockbuster doesn't ever look weak. Just then a baton bounces off Brutale's head and Nightwing asks, is this really where you wanted to be in life? Henchmen shaking down children. That's gotta be a career low. Alexicutioner fires off an electric blast, but Tim jumps in kicking and knocking him down. Nightwing then puts his batons together, screwing them in and tosses it to Tim, telling him to catch. Together, the two take on Brutale and Electrocutioner on their own, but a stray knife from Brutale shorts out Electrocutioner's power. Nightwing tells them to go back and inform Blockbuster that this area is under his protection. And as the two look around, they see the tents on fire and the children screaming for help. Tim looks back asking the thugs if they're the ones who did this and Electrocutioner says, no, you can't get money from dead people. Tim radios back that something is off. He can smell the accelerant from here. This fire was deliberately lit. Nightwing tells him that he knows. It was them, Heartless. Through the fire, Nightwing can see Heartless standing there, staring right at him. Fire begins to spread around the homeless children's encampment with Nightwing telling everyone to stay behind him. Barbara radios in asking what's going on and Nightwing tells her that he's here, Heartless. Nightwing looks back at the kids, telling them to hang on tight. He's going to get them out of here and, but that's the moment that Heartless takes out a fire extinguisher, clearing a path. Come on kids, off you go. Nightwing asks, what is he doing? And Heartless tells him, I don't want to watch them die. I want to watch them run. He reaches into his coat, pulling out the gun that he uses to steal hearts, telling him, I've heard of you. Was hoping we'd get a chance to meet Nightwing, Bloodhaven's guardian angel. You must have quite a heart. The gun is fired, but Nightwing ducks, throwing his baton, but before it can even hit Heartless, he catches it, using it to smack Nightwing back with his own weapon. Barbara again asks what is going on, and Nightwing says that he just got hit so hard that he is seeing a concerning number of spots for a guy who should avoid more head injuries. Heartless follows up with a heavy punch, but Nightwing rolls out of the way just in time, telling him, you're fast and strong, but that's all you are. 
Your technique is terrible. You have the upgrades, but you haven't done the work. Like you've tried to take a shortcut to super villainy. Nightwing continues to dodge all of Heartless' attacks, but then jumps behind him to choke him out, telling him, It doesn't matter how strong you are, you still need to breathe. Heartless shouts in anger, throwing Nightwing off, and Nightwing tells him, That's it, get angry, I can work with that. Heartless gets back up, scoffing. This can wait, I can kill you later. And you expect what, that we're just gonna walk away? Heartless tells him, Of course you will, because I know your pathetic weakness. You care. Heartless pulls out a small switch, telling him, All those kids are running? They're running towards the pier, which is where I wanted them to go. I wanted to see their fear. I wanted to see their faces. But it's okay. I can have a pretty vivid imagination. Nightwing quickly repels out, radioing to Tim. It's a trap! Get the kids off the pier! But before Tim has a chance to respond, Heartless activates the bombs, blowing up the only walkway back to land. The fire quickly spreads and Tim tells them all that he's going to need a better option than forcing a bunch of kids into the sea. You got any ideas, dick? Nightwing continues to make his way over to them, telling Barbara to patch him into the Maritime Distress Channel. If they need help, they should try asking for it. Once the line is connected, Nightwing calls out, Mayday, Mayday, there are hundreds of children in need of rescue at the end of Bloodhaven Pier 12. I repeat, for a few moments there's nothing. Then all of the ships across the harbor begin to report in that they are on their way. The message has been heard. Nightwing stops for a moment. Not everything in the city is broken. Barbara, alert the local hospital and, but before he could finish his statement, he passes out. A short while later, Nightwing awakens in his apartment asking what happened and Barbara examines him telling him that he lost consciousness. He is still recovering from being shot in the head and being hit by an enhanced supervillain. Nightwing sits up. Yeah, that would do it. Tim tells him that Bitewing was worried too, and Nightwing's dog begins to wag her tail and bark. <laughs> Bitewing? It's actually great, but her name is Haley. Tim asks if he's really going to tell the people in this room that they can't have two names. And Barbara says, I have three! But while you were out, I did some digging. The woman that we saw Boss Maroney with the other day, I found out who she is. As Barbara holds up her laptop, Nightwing looks at the picture and a headline stating Mayor Zuko. And Nightwing asks, wait, what? Barbara says she did more research. She's Tony Zuko's daughter from his first marriage, but Tony didn't stick around past her eighth birthday to raise her. Nightwing sighs. Well, that's a positive. And Tim tells him that she was raised by the Maroney family instead, and Nightwing says, right, that's so much worse. I really wanted to help clean up the city with the officials, but this, this is going to make it a lot harder. I'll pay Melinda Zuko a visit and see what I could find out. But Barbara tells him, absolutely not. You need rest. Your injuries aren't something that you can just brush off. So, Nightwing rests long enough for Barbara and Tim to leave. There's no way that he was going to sleep in when the criminal daughter of the men who killed his parents is now the mayor of his city. He sneaks over to Melinda's apartment, breaking in, and when he does, Melinda's bodyguard waits for him around the corner. As she swings, Nightwing ducks, rolls, kicking the sword away, but still manages to be thrown off balance enough to be knocked down the stairs. Melinda comes out of the next room with a bat, stating, It's okay, Audrey, I've got this! And all Nightwing could hear after that was a loud thud. So a short while later, Nightwing shakes his head, waking up again. He could already feel that his arms and legs are tied up, and wait, there's more. His mask, his mask is gone. As Nightwing looks up, Melinda holds up the mask. Dick Grayson? In a fit of anger, Nightwing rips the ropes, telling her, You know me? Well, I know you too. You worked for the Maroney crime family, and you're the daughter of Tony Zuko. Melinda says, No, she's not. She thought she was for a long time, but when she learned the truth, her real father is John Grayson. I'm your sister. As the dimly lit room falls silent with that news, Nightwing stands still for a moment, processing what he was just told. I've studied my family tree. I'd know if my father had other children. Melinda begins to question him, but he quickly pulls out his mask, and he says, hold on a second. In his earpiece, Barbara is shouting, asking if everything's okay, and Nightwing tells her, yeah, yeah, uh, call off whatever rescue is about to take place. She tells him that they attacked him, and Nightwing says that these people defended themselves from a masked man who broke into their home. As the call goes out, everyone turns back, and Nightwing lets out a sigh of relief, with Melinda asking if everything's okay. He tells her, yeah, he almost had a building full of very overprotective superheroes. Anyway, let's talk. A few moments later, in a quick change, Nightwing asks who is he meeting, and Melinda walks into the next room stating that this is her mother. Nightwing steps in and the older woman turns and looks at him, quietly gasping. Oh my god, it's like looking back in time. You look so much like John. 
You have the same kindness in your eyes, and there's Mary shining in that beautiful Romani smile. She looks over at Melinda asking what has she told him, and Melinda says only who she was. She thought that the rest best come from her. So she explains that her name is Malie Lim, and this all began a long time ago when she was 23 and paid for when she came to this country. Tony Zuko was violent and possessive, and she had no interest in being possessed. So one night, Tony took her to a circus, and that was where she took her opportunity to escape. She ran away, blending in with the crowd, and when Tony went looking, he found John. Tony was, well, quick to point his gun, asking where she went, but of course, John wasn't having it. There was a scuffle, and both Mary and John were about to take Tony down when they were stopped by the ringleader. When asked what he was doing, Tony said that he was looking for his wife, to which the ringleader said, no one has come by except the performers, and with that, he kindly asked Tony to leave. Once Tony left, the ringleader asked if she is in his trailer, and John told him, of course. So after that, she joined the circus, traveling with John and the others. But please understand, this was before his parents were together. John and her weren't involved very long, but long enough. Tony eventually found out and came back to take her back, and he and his thugs hurt John pretty bad. It was after that that she gave birth to Melinda. Tony's ego wouldn't allow him to voice what he suspected, but he always knew the truth, and he got angrier. The next time that she escaped, Tony didn't try to stop her. He was going to bring Melinda to the circus to see John, but then she found him. They all looked so happy performing together. John, his new wife, and Dick. And after everything that they had done for her before, they didn't deserve this. They didn't deserve an illegitimate child, a woman fleeing again. So she left. She had always planned to come back one day, but before she found the courage, Tony killed them. She was always so sorry for what happened for what that cowardly, abusive man Tony Zuko did to them and to him. But you have a good life now, right? You're loved? Nightwing tells her yes. Mei Li nods, stating, good. She's glad that him and Melinda finally have a chance to meet. And did he hear? She's now the mayor. Nightwing says that he knows. It was wonderful to meet them, and as much as he wanted to, Nightwing held back wanting to say sorry that her daughter was also a criminal. As the two leave, he asks, your mother doesn't know the truth, does she? about who you really are. Melinda says that he doesn't know who she is. And just then there's a knock at the door. And as Audrey looks out, she sees dozens of armed police and a large looming shadow. As the lights shine through the room, Melinda asks what's happening. And Audrey says that it's him. It's Blockbuster. Seconds later, Commissioner McLean calls out over his speaker. This is the Bloodhaven PD, come out with your hands up. Blockbuster says two minutes, two minutes, and I'm going in, Commissioner. Back at the other side of the door, Melinda says before whatever this is happens, he needs to know the truth. Nightwing tells her, I do know the truth. I've seen your FBI file. Melinda tells him that what he probably saw was a file with more redaction than words. Fine, tell me you don't work for Boss Maroney and Blockbuster. She says that she doesn't, but both men certainly think that she does. Her file will tell him that she grew up with the Maronis, but what it won't tell him is that she brought down two crime bosses from the inside. Now she's worked very hard to get to where she's at, and she plans to do the exact same thing for Bloodhaven. Nightwing is stunned. Wait, really? You have difficulty believing that someone could have a double life, Dick? I thought about what kind of person you might be for years, and you know that my brother is Bloodhaven's guardian superhero? We can help each other. We can bring these people down. Actually, we can do even more. Nightwing says, I was about to do something, and well, I want to tell you. I want to believe you. McLean yells over the speaker that they know that Nightwing is in there. So Nightwing gets changed, telling her, right now, they need to think that I'm a dangerous vigilante that just broke into the mayor's home. After two minutes, Blockbuster kicks down the door, seeing Melinda and Audrey tied to the chairs and asks, did Nightwing get anything from you? She tells him no. Did he have people watching her house? Blockbuster unties her. Of course, I protect all of my assets. Where is he? Audrey motions her head towards the open window informing Blockbuster that Nightwing went that way. So Blockbuster turns, charging out through it. Outside, one of the helicopters calls out that he's on the roof, so Blockbuster jumps up, landing in front of Nightwing. <laughs> I'm so over men who think that they're so powerful, the law doesn't apply to them, and I know Mayor Zuko is working for you. I'll find a way to prove it, Blockbuster. <laughs> doesn't matter. I own the police, the courts, even Bloodhaven. No one would act against me, Nightwing. Sure, you scare a lot of people, 
but don't confuse fear with respect. Plenty of people would like to see you face some consequences. Blockbuster charges in, punching down where Nightwing is standing, and as Nightwing dodges, he says, This isn't a fight we should have. It's a long way down. Right! Fire! Suddenly, a turret on the helicopter opens fire onto the building, with Nightwing beginning to run towards it. As he gets closer, he leaps up, shooting two hooks from his batons that latch onto two of the officers, and uses that to swing up under the chopper and up through the opening. After tying the men up, the pilot holds out his cuffs, telling him, Just take us in the chopper. So, a few days later, after getting some rest, Nightwing lands on a building. Superman flies over to him, asking, What brings you to Metropolis? Nightwing looks at the Man of Steel. I have an idea, and I thought I might need some advice from someone with a unique perspective. From an alien? No, one of the most human people I know. Alfred left me a lot, but I don't think that there's anything heroic about being a billionaire. I'm sorry about Alfred, Dick. I looked up to him. Nightwing asked, Wait, Superman looked up to Alfred Pennyworth? <laughs> of course I did. The world would have been lost without the heroes that he helped raise. Without his generosity, his love, his support, the two of us are a lot alike. Now, what's your idea? Later as the sun rises, Superman says that that is quite an idea. And Nightwing tells him, yeah, I'm worried that it's too small. No, no, no. It's not small, it's focused. If you're successful, the rest of the country, the rest of the world could see that's possible. But you already know about this. You don't need anyone else's input. You thought it through enough. Superman then begins to fly up telling him, I need to grab dinner, but I have a favor to ask. I might have to go away for a while, and a lot's going to fall on my son, John. It would mean a lot if you could give him some guidance and maybe some friendship, Dick. Of course. If you think it'll help, I'll be there. Superman tells him, Honestly, I couldn't think of any better role model. Thank you. So a few days later, Nightwing is looking out of his apartment, stating that there's a lot of press outside, and it would be easier with a mask. Barbara tells him that he's talked about it for days. He knows what he's doing. Does he know what he's going to name it? Nightwing tells her he does, but before he goes, he wants to say thanks for her friendship. If it wasn't for her, he wouldn't be able to. But Barbara grabs and kisses him to stop him and says, go get him, Boy Wonder. After taking a deep breath, Nightwing steps out, speaking into the microphone. My name is Dick Grayson, and I've just become a billionaire. But I don't believe any one person should have so much when others have so little. So I'm giving it all away. I've decided to use it to establish one of the world's largest self-sustaining foundations. I'm going to be helping targeted areas elsewhere in the world, and the bulk of this wealth will go directly into Bloodhaven. This will be the first phase. I want to help. So today, I'm announcing the Alfred Pennyworth Foundation. As he finishes his speech, he heads back inside, and everyone texts him about what a great job he's done. Even Batman calls to let him know that he honored Alfred today. Meanwhile, elsewhere, two men are watching the news, and the first says, Dick Grayson, and the second asks, Do you know him? The Shadow Man says yes. His first. He owes him so much. Grayson made him into what he is today. The plans that he has for Bloodhaven don't really line up with him, though. Heartless sits in his chair, holding a jar with a heart in it, stating, I'll have to take his heart before he gives it to the city. With Dick Grayson coming out publicly about his money and wanting to change Bloodhaven, he has gotten the attention of a lot of people as Dick Grayson. Some of those people are not happy with his imaginative goals, though. While on his way to a meeting about public housing, Babs gives him a call, telling him that he needs to get off the streets. Someone has put a price on his head. Dick says that it wouldn't be the first time that someone has put a bounty on Nightwing. He annoys a lot of people. But that's the beauty about having a secret identity. Bab tells him, no, the hit isn't on Nightwing. It's on Dick Grayson. No sooner than Bab tells him that, but a group of assassins pull up on the side of the road and begin to open fire. Dick stating, okay, people are trying to kill me in broad daylight. What's the price? Babs tells him that it's 10 million, and Dick says, that's a lot for wanting me dead. Kind of hard to not take it personally. He ducks into an alleyway to change into his Nightwing costume, and Nightwing says that he needs to get home, but Barbara says that that is the last place that he needs to be. It's just not safe there. Nightwing tells her that it doesn't matter. His alarm is already going off, and she's there. Barbara switches minds says telling him to get home now. As Nightwing jumps into his apartment building, fighting through the hired gunman, he gets to his apartment and he can already hear Haley barking from downstairs as one of the men jumps into the back of the van carrying the pup. Nightwing then leaves back out, swinging through the streets, landing on top of the speeding van, grabbing the passerby, telling the driver to pull over. Another gunman appears from behind, trying to shoot him off, but as Nightwing stumbles and falls, a passerby on a motorcycle quickly jumps off, telling him to take the bike. 
Following a tracker on Haley's collar, Nightwing makes it to an old abandoned warehouse where Babs meets him in costume to take down the assassins. Together they bust in while Nightwing takes the low ground while Batgirl takes the skylights. Within seconds, the two dispatch the men and they make their way to the office where the leader of the group is holding a gun to Haley, telling them to stay back. Nightwing grabs his baton, stating that this is cartoonishly evil, and he throws it, knocking the man out, causing him to throw Haley out the window. He rushes out, jumping through the window after her, catching her, and as Batgirl follows, the three swing off into the night as Batgirl says, good girl, and Haley barks as her face flaps in the wind. The next morning, Dick Grayson is off to another press meeting, but this time at the Bloodhaven docks, which is another chance for the unsavory to make an attempt on his life. Dick Grayson tells everyone that he wants to thank the city and the mayor for having him here today. Until recently, tents full of unhoused people were occupying where they stand. While the Alfred Pennyworth Foundation works with local groups to house every young person who has ever lived here for this to work, they can't take away the home that they've already made. So instead of removing it, they're going to improve upon it. This will remain the hub for their community, for their friends, for the people who make them feel safe. And today they're going to break ground on Haven. Just as the first shovel hits the ground, there's a loud bang out of a rifle. Across the way, Starfire bends the barrel of Gun Bunny's rifle, stating that she is in a lot of trouble. Over the radio, someone asks if it's done. Report, Gun Bunny? As Gun Bunny tries to run, Donna pulls the earpiece out, telling the person that she is sorry, but Gun Bunny can't come to the concealed earpiece right now. As the two report back to Babs that they got the person attempting to assassinate Dick Grayson, Babs tells them that she knows Gun Bunny, and Gun Bunny doesn't work alone. Gun Hawk is somewhere. Beast Boy Radio is in stating that he doesn't see anything, and Babs tells everyone that they need to pull Dick out of there. At that moment, Gun Hawk leans out of a window from a nearby building and takes a shot, but suddenly Dick disappears in a red and yellow blur. As the Flash comes to a stop holding Dick, Dick asks what is he doing here. Flash tells him that he knows exactly why he's here, to save him. So the next question is cradle or piggyback? A few moments later, over at Mr. Terrific's labs, Mr. Terrific sees Dick riding on Flash's back. He chose piggyback, definitely the preferred option. As Dick climbs down and shakes Mr. Terrific's hand, asking what's going on, Mr. Terrific tells him that Flash thought that they should work to protect him. Flash then says to come follow him so they can try out his new suit. Dick looks at the Nightwing suit and Mr. Terrific tells him that given his civilian identity is under threat, they have built it thin enough to wear under his regular clothing. This suit will be more flexible and mobile. Most bulletproof material remains vulnerable to stabbing attacks, but they've worked on making this Nightwing suit defend pointed attacks. Dick says, you guys built a suit for me? And Flash laughs, well, Michael did most of the work, but yeah, being one of your best friends, I have a vested interest in you not dying. Back at the docks, more gunmen arrive looking for Dick Grayson, shouting to the crowd asking where did he go, and Melinda yells that they're making a huge mistake. There will be consequences. As one of the gunmen turns to her, a voice calls out, and Nightwing swings in, kicking the man, yelling, CONSEQUENCES HAVE ARRIVED! Starfire and the others charge in, and Nightwing asks, what are they all doing here? With Beast Boy stating, of course, dude! We had this long conversation with your dog, and decided that we're gonna back you up on this. Bitewing is very persuasive. But while Nightwing and the Titans are cleaning up the rest of the gunmen across town, Blockbuster slams his fist on a table, yelling, SOMEONE! ANYONE! REPORT! Suddenly, there's a flash of light, and as Raven teleports the others in, Beast Boy says, I'm pretty sure we got them all here. Blockbuster then shouts that they are trespassing on his property. That means that he has every right to, and Starfire walks up asking him, do what? You've confused being large and cruel with being powerful. Would you like to test your theory? Beast Boy says, oh, you should definitely test it. It's going to be hilarious. Donna then says that from this point on, Dick Grayson is under the protection of the Titans. As Raven teleports everyone back out, Blockbuster radios to Gunhawk asking what is happening. Over in that apartment, Gunhawk is thrown against the wall asking, What the hell, man? And Heartless says that he was about to take Dick Grayson's heart. It belongs to me. Gunhawk gets up stating that he has 10 million reasons for stopping that heart from beating. He doesn't care what weird, but Heartless slams him into the wall again asking, who hired you? And after a few moments of struggling, Gunhawk tells him, Blockbuster! It was Blockbuster! Of course it was. I'm going to have to get a bigger jar to hold what I take from him. Which leads me to my next question. Is there someone who will miss you? Someone who relies on you? Gunhawk tells him, it, yeah, there is. Bunny, 
She's... We're everything to each other. Heartless tells him, Perfect. And he takes Gunhawk's heart. Long ago, Batman and Nightwing went out following the path of a destructive, super-powered person. They followed him to a cave. And Batman says to be cautious. They don't know. At that moment, two laser beams shoot out, nearly cutting the two of them. And they pull back with Batman asking, What happened? Nightwing asks, What happened? He's hiding in a cave and a giant bat showed up. After taking off his mask, Nightwing walks into the cave. Look, I'm sorry about that. There's nothing to be scared of. My name is Dick and I'm friends with your dad. It's good to meet you, John. Superboy sits there, his eyes still glowing. And Batman radios in, we found him. Before Batman can even get his hand off the earpiece, Superman is already there, holding his son close. John says that he flew. He knows that he shouldn't do it at night, but he did and he got lost. And he just, he kept getting lost. Nightwing reaches into one of Batman's pouches on his belt, asking John, guess what Batman keeps in here? Lollipops. Now, some sensible person pointed out that he keeps them dangerously close to the smoke bombs that are in similar shape and size, but he's pretty stubborn. Want to see me juggle? John wipes his face. Sure. And now we go to the current times. The grown-up John looks for the same comfort that he received back then by placing a crystal into a terminal, and Superman appears asking, What's wrong, son? John tells him, There's a creature coming from Metropolis. I turned it around, but people died. It's one of the hardest things about what we do. We choose to help, but we can't help everyone, son. We can't save everyone. We can only do our best. John tells his father that he feels responsible, but Superman tells him, It's not your fault. You have to not think about the ones that are lost, but think about the ones that you saved. John sulks. Lies aren't numbers, Dad. Superman sighs. No, they're not. I'm sorry. This isn't what I was hoping for when I called you, Dad. This is... I can't have the real thing. I would prefer some solitude. Later over in Bloodhaven, Bab sits up in bed telling Dick to wake up. There's a robot petting his dog. Without a second thought, Dick grabs a baton, chucking it. But Keelix catches it, telling him, You dropped this fast in my direction. Dick grabs the baton, asking, What are you doing here? Kal-El said to seek you out in case his son needed you. So the next morning in Metropolis, the former Titan, Risk, jumps and dodges a group of villains, stating that now that they are clear of the civilians, he can hit back. But then he's blasted by a laser, and Risk laughs. Ha! You guys know I'm invulnerable, right? And the attackers tell him, We know. They slam into Risk, dragging him over into the water, holding him below, telling him, Even if you're invulnerable, you need to breathe. The rising has begun. So later aboard the floating headquarters of The Truth, Dick goes to meet with The Truth's leader, Gossamer, who's actually Superman's boyfriend, Jake Nakamura, in disguise, with Superman pretending to be Gossamer's assistant. And he's really bad at hiding himself in a mask. Dick shakes Gossamer's hand, stating that he's doing important work, and Gossamer says that what Dick is doing in Bloodhaven is inspiring. So Dick then says that he's more than happy to continue to fund what they're doing, but truth requires trust, and it's hard to trust information when it comes from a masked man. The assistant, aka Superboy, says that there's no way that he can take it off. It's not about him. Someone close to him is in danger, and they would be under more threats if Gossamer were to reveal himself. Dick tells them that he understands, but he has had a lot of people out to get him recently. Still, at that moment, Aerie and Wink fly down, and Gossamer asks, what is it? Aerie says that there is a dead body that has been found in Metropolis Harbor. A superhero's body. Dick turns and says that obviously they need to get to work. We can meet up again when things have calmed down. But once he's away from everyone, he whispers, I know I'm being heard. Meet me at the crime scene. Later, as John is hovering, asking Nightwing how did he know that he was John, Nightwing says, you know, I'm a pretty good detective, and I've spent a lot of time around people in masks. Masks are effective, but you can't rely on them alone to hide your identity. You also need to work on another voice when you're wearing one. It might sound ridiculous, but it's an important part of all of this. The two look down at the ground where Risk was dragged, and John asks if he knew him. And Dick says not well. Risk was a titan once, one of them. Risk was invulnerable and strong. Whoever did this had to be stronger. Judging by there not being any footprints, they're possibly dealing with another superpowered person. Oracle then radios in, stating that she just found that Risk wasn't the only person killed last night. An empath was killed in Brazil, and a telekinetic person was thrown out of the sky in Spain. John looks down and scans, seeing a faint trail of energy left behind by the attackers, and he begins to follow it. 
Nightwing asks if he found anything, and if he did, where does it lead? And John says, where almost everything bad leads to in Metropolis. Nightwing looks over in the distance and sees LexCore. John tells him, Lex Luthor. Now we go back in time a little bit, to three days ago, when the former Titan Risk was killed in Metropolis. You see, he was experienced, invulnerable, and strong, but whatever he was up against was stronger. On that same night, two more superheroes were found murdered. And since then, Oracle has ordered all superheroes to not work alone. However, one superhero in particular kept working alone. As a group of men load a truck full of illegal firearms, one is struck in the head with a baton and then struck down by Nightwing. He begins taking the men down, stating, It's an awfully nice night. Why would you guys spend it trafficking illegal weapons? But his actions in Metropolis have caught the attention of those responsible for killing heroes, as he is now the only superhero working alone. Three people begin to float above him, and one tells him that he can't run. But Nightwing smiles. Actually, I can't. Half this job is cardio. Nightwing then fires his grappling hook up onto a nearby building to get eye level with the foes. But the first one tells him, you can't escape. The rising is here. Nightwing asks, is that what you're calling it? Aren't you guys being a little overconfident just blurting it out there like that? The man grabs Nightwing by the neck, throwing him off of the building. But as they watch them plummet, he seems oddly comfortable and then they see someone flying up towards them. John Kent rockets up, punching the villains back, telling the group, I would like to ask you a few questions. Meanwhile, on Gamora, the one known as President Bendix, watches the situation, asking why Superman is there. He's supposed to be out of the country. One of the men says that they watched him fly away. He shouldn't be here. And John tells them, sure, but the world is round. I just kept flying and ended up back here. Nightwing thought you were spying on him. The man asks, well, shouldn't you be saving Nightwing? And John tosses the baton over the ledge. Nah, Nightwing doesn't need saving. Over the ledge, Nightwing gracefully falls as he activates the glider in his suit, catching the baton and using it to grab onto the building and fling himself back up onto the roof with everyone asking, ah, what did I miss? As all three of the villains attack John to no success, John says, you all seem pretty angry. Energy then shoots it by Nightwing's head as he tilts his head to avoid it. And he says, you know, I don't feel like I'm pulling my weight in this team up. And John laughs at him. <laughs> Being bait is an integral part of our team up, but feel free to join in. The first man then attempts to headbutt John and as he breaks his own nose, he tells the others to retreat. Nightwing asks the question, who headbutts Superman? The other two end up flying back towards the LexCorp building. And as John scans it, he notices a massive complex tunnel system beneath the building. As John asks, how does Luther even get contractors for a job like that? Nightwing then asks, why don't we ask that guy? He tried to headbutt Superman. Clearly he's not the brightest. So back at Gamora, Bendix yells to the operators to terminate him, activate speech control and start the countdown maximum blast. Suddenly the man's tone changes and Bendix tells John through the man's voice that John is not Superman. He is a child in his father's clothing. And while looking back at the man who's now being controlled by this mystery Bendix person, John sees a small implant beeping. The man suddenly refers back to himself, asking, Superman? And before John could do anything, his head explodes. John stares for a moment, and Nightwing steps out from behind him, asking if he's okay. After seeing John's defeated face, Nightwing reaches out, and he hugs him. Later that night at John's house, Nightwing walks into John's room, stating that it was a rough night. He isn't going to tell him what he doesn't want to hear, but he's been in that same headspace before. There's no point in telling him to stop feeling guilty, but he will sit here and drink tea with him so he doesn't have to be alone. Or he could juggle for him again like that day in the cave. John laughs and says that that was effective when he was nine, but does he think that his dad would have found a way to save him? Would the real Superman have saved that man from the explosive? Nightwing says that he had to step into Bruce's shoes before. He's been Batman. He knows how hard it is to be the replacement hero. John asks if he felt like he belonged though, like he earned the title of Batman. Nightwing laughs. <laughs> Hell no. Turns out, I do have a superpower though. It's called enhanced imposter syndrome. The trick is working out that you're not going to be the hero that you worship. You have to be your own. John hangs his head. You were my hero. Always thought you would swoop in and save me when I was lost or scared. As John goes on explaining his prison on Earth-3, the one where he aged, there's a sudden shout of his name and Nightwing jumps into action, grabbing the first thing to attack with, a stuffed mammoth plush. Stepping out of the wall, asking, Dick Grayson? And Nightwing says, y yes 
Lois asks, what is the matter? And John tells her that everything's okay. And Nightwing asks, is it? A guy walked through your wall, John. Lois kicks in the door with an overly sized energy gun yelling, what's going on? Everyone stares at each other for a moment. And John says that it's okay. Jay, tell them who you are. Jay looks at Nightwing and says that he's the editor of the truth. And Nightwing stops. Seriously? Jay taps on his tablet, stating that someone exploded in John's arms. Gamora released satellite footage claiming that the man was a hero and that John was the one who killed him. Nightwing asks Lois if she's ready to stomp some lies, and she tells him, of course. So Nightwing tells John that he doesn't need to worry about this. They've got his back. And remember, you're not alone anymore, John. As some of Bloodhaven's elite sit in Blockbuster's building, Blockbuster tells everyone that in exactly five minutes, Dick Grayson will die. Maroney says that there's a lot of proficient killers that have failed before. What makes this time different? Blockbuster says because this time he has gone directly to La Agent Fumbre. McLean asks what is that? And Nightwing's half-sister Melina says that she is just a myth. But Blockbuster tells them that she is not a myth, just very expensive. But he is frustrated and has decided to pay a premium for their certainty. And La Agent Fumbre's agent doesn't care about collateral damage. Dick Grayson's entire apartment building is about to be taken out. Meanwhile, over at Nightwing's apartment, he's laying in bed with Haley when he suddenly gets a ping on his phone. Normally, he would keep more things silent because just the bat chat alone doesn't end. But for him to actually hear a notification, that message must be important. He looks at it, and it's from Melina, which says that the building is about to be hit. Get out. He quickly leaps out of bed and begins to run, but remembers that his apartment building isn't just him anymore. There are tenants who live here. As Nightwing smashes the fire alarm, shouting that there's a fire, one tenant comes out telling him that Mr. Maurice is on floor three. He doesn't sleep with his hearing aid in. He hands Haley his dog to the lady, telling her to go ahead and get the kids out of here. He'll get Maurice. He runs back into his room, changing into his costume, kicking in Maurice's door, grabbing the hearing aid. But Maurice sits up shouting, who are you and why are you here stealing my hearing aid? Nightwing stops, stares for a moment and says, no. But Oracle radios in, stating that she just picked up a warning that something is entering the Bloodhaven airspace and it's moving fast. It looks like a military drone heading straight for the building. Nightwing grabs Maurice, smashing out the window, getting ready to jump out. But as he does, he sees a missile shooting right towards him. As the missile zips right over, he leaps out, grappling onto the building. But some of the debris then flies back, hitting him in the head. And a few moments later, over in Keystone City in the West Home, Linda wakes up when she hears a notification on her phone going off. She looks at it, stating that it looks like there's an explosion in Bloodhaven. And as she looks closer, she realizes that this is Dick Grayson's home. Before she can even finish questioning where this is at, Wally West is already out the door and running to Bloodhaven, asking the residents if everyone made it out. The woman from before says Dick Grayson went back in for Mr. Maurice on the third floor, but Wally didn't need to hear any more. He started getting to work, pulling away the rubble, trying to find signs of his buddy Nightwing. He'll do whatever it takes to get to him. So much so that with his fast healing, he actually breaks his fingers several times over getting the rubble out. But as Nightwing lands with Mr. Maurice, he looks over. Flash? And Wally runs over, hugging him. Sirens can be heard in the distance, and as they get closer, Wally tells him, Good, the police are on their way. But Nightwing tells him, Yeah, but this is Bloodhaven. They're actually probably looking to finish the job. Wally asks him what does he mean, and Nightwing motions towards the destroyed building. This entire attack was about me, Wally. I'd better get changed and show face before people start worrying. But Wally brings up a rather good point. You see, no one knows where Dick Grayson is in this fire. Maybe he should stay low for a moment while they figure out who is trying to actually kill him. Before Nightwing can even object, Wally picks him up and runs him back to his house so that Nightwing can stay with him, Linda, and the kids. Linda comes out telling him, hey, is everything okay? And Nightwing tells her that he's just a little disoriented. And Linda jokes, did Wally bring you here without warning first? He does that, it's terrible. So the next morning at the commissioner's office, McLean begins his investigation on the apartment building, interviewing the woman from before, asking if there's anything that she can tell him about the explosion. She says that there was a fire alarm and Dick Grayson said that there was a fire, but she didn't see any smoke. McLean says that he appreciates her time. Mr. Desmond has generously offered to pay for a hotel room for any of the displaced residents. As she leaves, McLean grabs his phone, calling Blockbuster, stating that either La Agent Fubre isn't as effective as he says, or someone in their meeting tipped off Grayson. Back at the West household, 
Nightwing wakes up from a night of much needed rest, and Wally says that he started making a board of all the people who wanted to see Dick dead. Nightwing says that that's the thing. There's been a lot of hired guns, but they were only ever shooting him. A strike on the apartment was more of an unrestrained thing. He should probably talk to his sister. This, of course, surprises Wally, as it probably did most of our viewers. What? Your sister? And Nightwing explains it. Yeah, she's on the inside. She's the mayor of Bloodhaven. Wally feels like he's missed out on a few key important details. So, Dick begins to explain who Melina is and how she's related to him. But back over in Gotham, Barbara Gordon walks home when she's approached by a group of men. One of them flashes a gun, telling her that she'll survive this if she cooperates. They just want information on her boyfriend. Detectives have interviewed her twice about Dick Grayson's apartment and... But Barbara yells that that doesn't make him her boyfriend. Honestly, we really haven't put a label on a relationship yet. So after a few moments, she radios over stating, Hey, I just got kidnapped at gunpoint and thrown in the back of a refrigerated van. Are you busy at the moment? Nightwing asks, where is she? She tells him that she's pretty sure she's headed west on Tim's and 6th. White van, license plate 2GAT213. So it doesn't take very long before the van pulls up to a warehouse and the driver gets out looking at KG Beast, the man that shot Nightwing in the head many months ago, causing his amnesia. They explain that they have the package, so KG Beast gets ready to question her. But as they open up the door, it's Nightwing and Wally West that jump out. But Wally stops asking, wait, isn't that the guy that shot you in the head? Nightwing tells him, yeah, it is. And Wally goes on, we have a long list of friends who want to get their hands on this guy. I'm glad I'm first. KG Beast and the gunmen open fire and Wally rushes out cracking KG Beast in the head, telling him that he knows that this can't be heard because he's moving too fast, but he wants to say it anyway. This will be the last time that he ever points a gun at Nightwing. You tried to murder my best friend. You almost succeeded. So I'm going to make sure to stop you each and every single time. I have all the time in the world. And once he disarms KG Beast, he moves over to the rest, tying them all up. But he missed one thing. KG Beast was holding onto a remote, and he presses the button, stating that he thought that this might happen. So there's a contingency plan in place. The remote is to a bomb somewhere in the city. You have one hour until it blows. You don't have time to deal with me and the... And Nightwing simply interrupts him. It's over in the Gotham Library. How the hell did you know that?! The van is full of bomb-making equipment, and the last place the van's GPS searched for was the library. Plus, you just admitted it. Flash, can you? Wally runs off, and Nightwing turns back to KG Beast. Now, who are you working for? KG Beast says that they both know that he won't talk, so Nightwing pulls off KG Beast's mask. Yeah, we'll see. What? You wanted to see my face when you get to the torture part of this? Nightwing smiles. No, I just needed your face to unlock your phone. Later back at Wally's house, Barbara gets to work sifting through KG Beast's phone, with Nightwing asking, how's it going? Barbara tells him that she found whoever he was working for is working very hard to hide and doing as good as a job as she has ever seen. This person has no number, no service, no name. It's like whoever KG Beast was calling doesn't exist. But at that moment, Nightwing gets another message from his sister. All it says was La Agent Fumbre. Barbara says that those people are a myth. And Nightwing tells her that he thought so as well. And that's also what Batman thinks. But Damien once swore to him that this person was real. Barbara looks back at her computer, realizing that she can't get the exact location of the number, but she did narrow it down to a cell tower. Everyone looks at the screen, and they realize that the cell tower is in the middle of the Central American jungle. And Wally tells them all that it looks like they're on their way to Costa Rica. As they step outside, Wally turns to Nightwing. All right, how do you want to do this? Piggyback or a cradle? You have traveled to the future. You have met a hundred flashes. Did none of them come up with a better way to carry someone? Seconds later in Costa Rica, Wally stops in front of the mystery cell tower. Nightwing asks, how do they want to do this? And Wally rushes ahead, telling him that he'll scout the place out. Suddenly, several explosions go off, and Nightwing calls out to his friend. But Wally comes back. Yeah, I'm okay. I found a classic villain lair. And guess what else I found? Nightwing asks him, you found landmines, didn't you? Yeah, I found landmines! Nightwing then grabs his batons, telling him, well, whoever's out there, they know we're coming. So there's no point in hiding. The two approach the lone building as several assassins step out, and Nightwing notices something about them. They weren't expecting them. It's clear that they're used to fighting as individuals, whereas him and Wally have been working as a team since they were kids. So as the last of these killers are taken down, a helicopter begins to take off, and Wally makes a dash for it, bouncing off of an invisible wall. As the helicopter lands, a woman wearing a skull mask steps out. That force field was designed to stop anything moving quickly, mostly bullets and projectiles. 
but I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought of super speeding heroes when it was installed. As she pulls out two blades, she readies herself in her stance, and No Wing looks her up and down. You are Law Agent Fuembre. Without another word, she begins to attack, and Nightwing has to make an effort to dodge each strike. She isn't just fast, she's good. She's a master, and she doesn't do anything flashy. No lunge is for appearance or flair. Every hit is designed to hurt, to incapacitate, or to kill. She isn't afraid of fighting dirty. She doesn't want a fair fight. There's a quick flick of the wrist as she takes out a small blade, thrusting it into Nightwing's chest. But before it can land, he can already smell the poison. Her eyes are smiling through the mask. He's about to be dead. At least that's what she thinks. Wally and Mr. Terrific built his suit to be stamp-proof, so it just takes one hit to knock out the infamous assassin. Moments later, Wally begins to wake up. Did I, like, run into a wall? Did we win? After tying everyone up, Nightwing heads inside to access her computer and says that he can contact all of the assassins from right here, and no one would know that it wasn't sent from her. Wally tries to convince him to shut it down, but Nightwing tells him, we're going to use this. So he gives many of the top assassins marks for them to neutralize, but the targets just happen to be many of his close friends in disguise. Back in Bloodhaven, as all of the assassins are being taken off at the table by Nightwing's friends, Lady Shiva steps into Blockbuster's office. He asks if she's here about the Dick Grayson job, and she tells him no. This is a courtesy. For the first time in generations, La Agent Fumbre has been discovered and apprehended. Over 20 of the top assassins are in custody. One was found dead with his heart removed. Dick Grayson is protected from on high. No one will touch this job. If you want Dick Grayson dead, you're going to have to do it yourself, Blockbuster. Gotham was no stranger to blackouts back then. But even with things seemingly like they would never get better, Nightwing was never one to run away from someone who needed help. In fact, he ran towards them. During one of the many blackouts of the city... As Robin, Nightwing saw a man being chased by a group of looters. Batgirl was on her way, and Batman was busy dealing with his own fight, but he told the young Dick Grayson that there was nothing that he could do. Stay out of it. Do not engage. But no matter the threat, when Nightwing saw someone in danger, he leapt in. That night, his actions saved a life, even if it was at the cost of his own safety. By the time that Batgirl got there, it was already too late. Nightwing was beaten and nearly left for dead. An early lesson for his Robin days. She too would have fallen if not for the help of one Alfred Pennyworth. When Batman was finally able to return to the manor, he began to make his way to Dick Grayson's room, asking where is he, but Alfred stood guard, telling him, Calm yourself, sir. Batman yells that he told Dick Grayson not to engage. Alfred says that Master Grayson did what he felt was right, and he saved a life. Batman tells Alfred, step aside. And Alfred lifts his hand. No, we could have lost him tonight. I know that that scares you. But for once, you will not turn your fear into misplaced anger. You will direct as much of that fury towards me. But Master Richard is hurt. He needs comfort, not adonishment. Take off the cowl, leave your disapproval at the door, or do not enter, Bruce. After a few moments, Batman enters, maskless and humbled. Nightwing tells him that he's sorry. And Batman sits at the edge of his bed, telling him, You don't have to be sorry. You did what you felt you had to. But you need to remember, you can't protect everyone. The young Nightwing looks up, and he tells him, Maybe, but I can try. And that moment has followed Nightwing all the way up to our current day as he tries to turn Bloodhaven into an actual haven. He wants a place where they can go beyond just free food and shelter and transportation. But while walking through the grand opening of his haven, Nightwing sees someone that he didn't expect. Bruce Wayne is standing there with Ace the Bat Dog. Nightwing tells him that if he's here in case there's trouble. I appreciate it, but Flash has been running a constant circuit around the entire area faster than anyone can detect. I know. I saw him. Nightwing smiles at Bruce's matter-of-factness. Of course you did. Bruce then says that he's here because it's a big day. He wanted to be here. But they both know that he wouldn't approve of the statue. Nightwing tells him that he knows, and, well, he doesn't care. None of this would have been possible without Alfred. The statue's not just for Alfred, but for them as well. They all take a moment to reflect as they look upon the statue of Alfred 
but a voice cuts through the crowd as Blockbuster calls out Dick Grayson. Dick was not expecting him to be there, and Blockbuster tells him that this is his city. Nothing happens without him. They argue about it back and forth for a moment, with Blockbuster telling him that he finally got what he wanted, and Nightwing tells him, yeah, despite all of the attempts to stop it. They discuss bureaucratic roadblocks and the mayor's office in general, but Blockbuster really breaks down what he's doing there into a simple question. Was it wise for Dick Grayson to appear in person when everyone is trying to stop him? Bruce Wayne steps up, telling Blockbuster to be careful who he threatens, but Blockbuster just smiles. He reminds Bruce Wayne that he's no longer rich and he's no longer untouchable. But Dick Grayson pulls Bruce back, telling him, thank you for your concern, Blockbuster, but don't worry about my safety. I'm not opening Haven. We have a special guest doing the honors for me, and I'm not too concerned about speeding bullets. At that moment, Jonathan Kent Superman flies down to welcome everyone. And while all of the kids ask for selfies, Barbara asks Blockbuster if he's gonna get one too. The ceremonies begin and they seemingly go unhindered. And as night falls, a group of men begin to vandalize the Haven, the statue, the park, everything that Nightwing wanted to build. And he watches. Barbara asks if he needs backup, but he tells her no. He wants them to know that Haven is under Nightwing's protection, so he leaps off the nearby building and begins to take down the would-be thugs, and as he does, he begins to unmask them, telling them, you don't get to hide! If you're going to do this, the world will know who was destroying their Haven. You don't get to destroy things built to better people. The men quickly panic, pulling back on their masks, and Nightwing asks if Barbara got them. She tells him that the city cameras were down, conveniently but all of hers in Haven, they were working just fine. She got photos of their faces. And with that, Dick Grayson was able to donate his money and start up the Pennyworth Foundation. He was able to help Bloodhaven the way that he felt he should have. But over in Blockbuster's office, he calls it in asking what exactly happened and does Nightwing know that they were actually behind all of this? The voice on the phone tells him that he couldn't possibly, but then there's a loud banging coming from outside of his door. Blockbuster demands to know why does it sound like Nightwing is breaking into his offices. He swings open the door to see our villain Heartless standing there with several dead security guards. Heartless looks at Blockbuster. I saw you in the park today with Dick Grayson. I have a proposal. Bloodhaven has always been a rough place to live, and that's why Nightwing is trying his best to bring order and peace to the city. And after last night's attack, it has only filled him with more determination. As Nightwing is getting ready to wash off the graffiti that is on Alfred's statue, his tribute, Barbara asks if he's okay. He tells her, not really. She then says that she's running facial recognition on the people who did this. Will exposing them and punishing them accordingly make them feel better? And Nightwing laughs. <laughs> Yeah, it would, Babs. At that moment, Barbara notices activity in the park, and suddenly the voices yell out to Nightwing, telling him to freeze. Before he even has a chance to do what they say, they open fire on him, and he asks, Are you shooting at me for cleaning? He then throws the bucket of water, asking, What's the bigger threat, the cloth or the bucket? After knocking the officers out, he then hurries to grab his bike, and Barbara tells him that he needs to hurry up out of here. There are patrol cars coming in from every direction. As Nightwing speeds away, he looks back at the increasing amount of cars that are chasing him, stating, Yeah, looks like I gotta get off this road. And he presses a button on his bike. Suddenly, a small grappling hook shoots out of the bike, latching onto a sign, whipping him around it, launching him up into the highway. But as he goes to land, the front wheel hits the edge of the barrier and he falls off with a hard thud. She asks if he's okay. He should probably stay in Gotham tonight. And Nightwing tells her, Yeah, I'm on my way. So the next morning, he brings breakfast to Barbara at her desk as she tells him that she made a full database of the identities of the guys that he unmasked attacking Haven the other night. And he's going to want to see this. She brings up the name and Nightwing asks if she's serious. And she tells him, yep. This is terrible, but also great. You're incredible. That's why I love you. Suddenly, the two pause for a moment at those words. That was not supposed to uh come out she then asks are you sorry for stating that you loved me nightwing thinks about it for a moment yes no and then his phone rings and he quietly sighs thank god as he answers melinda says that she is sorry for calling him like this but wherever he is he's going to want to get out of haven as soon as possible 
He asks what's going on, and she tells him that the commissioner is using last night's attack to be a little extra grumpy. So a short while later, the police begin to detain the children of the park, and Nightwing, out of costume, walks up asking, all right, what is going on here? What do you think you're doing? Commissioner McLean asks if there's a problem, and Dick tells him, yeah. Haven is supposed to be a welcoming space, not very welcoming when these children are being treated like criminals. McLean says that a lot of these kids are criminals. They're just protecting the city. After last night, they wouldn't want anything else happening to this little project of his, would they? Dick says that he wants the officers out, but McLean smiles, telling him that he may need to accept that he is not in control of every situation. Dick then hears the squeal of the brakes as a new van begins to arrive, and he asks what is going on. McLean says that he invited the media here to talk about the terrible criminal activities that have occurred in Haven after only a single day of opening, and to talk about what the Bloodhaven PD is going to do about it. Dick whispers into his earpiece, calling for Barbara, and she asks, Now? And so he tells her, Now. Using Haley's paw, she hits enter with a boop, just as McLean begins to speak in front of the cameras. Everyone, I am deeply sorry to see these things happening. This betrayal of so much goodwill. The people that built this would bite the hand that feed them like this. Dick interrupts him. That is not true. There's a video of last night's attack, Kamish. McLean says that he's afraid that there isn't a video. The city's cameras were forcibly taken offline last night. Besides, even if we did have cameras, the people who did this were masked. Dick then asks him, and how would you know that? Everyone here can judge for themselves just how helpful the footage is going to be. It's just gone live, and links have been sent to every major news network. The video then shows several of the perpetrators being unmasked, and all of them have been independently identified as members of the Bloodhaven Police Department. As all of the reporters' phones begin to ping, they all look at it to see references, and they begin to call out to McLean for questions. He turns back to Dick. Where did that video come from? And Dick looks to him. You just may need to accept that you're not in control of every situation, Commissioner. As Dick walks away, he says that that couldn't have gone any better. Thank you. But Barbara tells him that he should be thanking Haley. It was one of her new tricks. He laughs. <laughs> what a good dog. But we need to talk about what's next. And she tells him later. For now, just enjoy this. Seriously, we don't get wins like this every day. So later that night, Melinda calls McLean at home, telling him that the feds know that he personally was the one who ordered the attack on Bloodhaven. She has someone on the inside feeding her information. He has 20 minutes until they come. He has a ticket waiting for him at the Bloodhaven airport. All he needs to do is just tell her where Blockbuster's files are, because if they get those, they all go down. McLean opens his safe, telling her that he has them, and he's taking them with him. There is only insurance. Thank you for the warning. I doubt we'll speak again. He hurries out of his home with Melinda hanging up, calling Oracle, stating that he took the bait. Get ready. So on the road, Nightwing catches up to McLean's escort, telling Barbara that he's got eyes on him. They just need to handle a few things first. After Nightwing lands on one of the motorcycles escorting the commissioner, the other one opens fire by Nightwing throwing a baton to knock the man off of his bike. He then spins the bike around, facing McLean head on. The two rev their engines, and Barbara says that she's pretty sure that this isn't how chicken works, and he's in a car! McLean isn't going to care if he hits you. Nightwing tells her, that's what I'm counting on. And the two race towards each other, with Dick crashing into the front end of McLean's car, causing him to swerve and crash. As McLean falls out of the vehicle, Nightwing says that there are about seven ways that they can do this. Do you want to know which of those is the least hurtful? McLean fires a shot, and Dick tells him, you know, that was incorrect. The correct answer was option three. He throws one of his batons, knocking the gun out of McLean's hand. And with no other choice, McLean desperately tries to fight and get away. Nightwing deflects the attacks, returning with his own, telling him, You're the man who disappoints me the most in the city. Blockbuster doesn't try to pretend to be anything other than a power-hungry thug, but you? You put on a badge and you swore to protect and serve. You're everything wrong with Bloodhaven, tucked into a uniform. After knocking McLean down, he picks up the briefcase and opening it. He's running to the airport. He has several fake passports and a boatload of cash. Not a good look, Commission. As the sound of sirens get closer, Nightwing picks up the blockbuster files and McLean yells to give them back. But Nightwing fires his grappling hook, telling him that it looks like the feds have caught up to you. Good luck with that. The next day, the attorney general holds a press conference announcing that Commissioner Gil McLean attempted to flee the country, but he was apprehended. 
The Bloodhaven Police Department has been a dark stain of all of the law enforcement in this nation. And with the help of Mayor Zuko, they have brought in someone who they think might be able to help turn things around. That is why she is happy to present Commissioner Margaret Sawyer. Her work in Metropolis is well known, and they are grateful that she has agreed to help them here. Margaret takes the podium. Thank you, and you can all call me Maggie. I'd like to thank the mayor for her appointment, and I can promise you that I and Dan Turbin will root out crime and corruption within the police force. No one will be above my attention. No one. As Blockbuster is watching the conference, the electrocutioner asks if they're going to make her disappear. Don't ask questions. It makes me wonder why you want answers. But no, she won't disappear. It would just lead to more unwanted attention. Now get in the car. Later, Barbara begins to go through all of the files that Blockbuster had, stating that they had everything that they could have ever wanted. Investments, drop-off locations, transactions, payments to criminals, police, and government officials. Melinda said that the feds are already questioning McLean, but even if he gives them nothing, they have everything that they need. The plane ticket with his name on it, though, was a nice touch, Oracle. Barbara asks if she's really okay with all of this, and Melinda says that she watched McLean drag the former mayor's body away before he disappeared. She isn't about to lose any sleep over this. Talk to you all later. But as she hangs up, she gets another call from Blockbuster, and he tells her that he is not pleased. Melinda tells him that she was given a list of names, and she picked who would be the least effective. Sawyer was the commissioner of Metropolis. How much crime has she had to deal with in a city with Superman? She didn't have much time. Blockbuster then says that she should have found time to talk to him, just like she should now. He's currently waiting for her in her mother's home. Melinda hurries to her mother's to find Blockbuster there and her mother pouring him tea. Can we go for a drive? Melinda tells him, of course, but whispers something to her mother that she'll be okay. As Melinda and Audrey get ready to get in, Audrey is stopped by one of Blockbuster's men telling her that it's a private conversation. She gets ready to take a swing, but Melinda tells her it's all right. And Blockbuster says that he promises not to keep her out too late. As the door shuts, Blockbuster says that they're being challenged. Haven. Now the commissioner. A man even threatened him in his own building two days ago. They look weak, and he doesn't like looking weak, and it all started with Dick Grayson. Grayson took a part of my city. He should have died when his building blew up long before this happened. Commissioner McLean questioned a woman from the building, and she said that Dick sounded the alarm before the attack. And I know who tipped him off. As the door to an abandoned warehouse opens up, the electrocutioner sits in a chair beaten, and Blockbuster looks to Melinda. It was him. It was a rat in her own ranks. He and Brutal were the only people in the room aside from us and Maroney when I shared the plan. He's the only one that we can't trust. Melinda asks what are they going to do to him, and Blockbuster says that they're going to send him a message. Actually, they're going to send him a lot of messages. So Melinda then asks, has he admitted to anything? No, but he will. Melinda grabs a pair of clippers, telling him to leave it to her. She'll find out exactly how much he knows. Blockbuster nods and leaves, and once he's gone, Melinda hurries over to pull the tape off of his mouth. Relax, don't scream. I'm going to get you out of here. After untying the binding, she calls Nightwing, telling him a man is about to die because of her tip-off, and Blockbuster's here. She needs him to. But that's when Electrocutioner shocks Melinda, and then calls her Blockbuster to come back. It was her! She was the rat! Nightwing yells over the phone, asking if she's there. Answer him, and Blockbuster picks up the phone. I'm afraid Melinda can't come to the phone right now, Mr. Grayson, and then crushes it. A short while later, Melinda begins to wake up with Brutal stating, Hey, welcome back, Madame Mayor. Blockbuster's pretty pissed at you, and now he wants some information. But before she could answer, there's a knock at the door. Brutal gets up telling Blockbuster that she's awake, and as he opens the door, Nightwing jumps in with a kick while throwing a baton and knocking out the electrocutioner. Melinda looks up asking how did he find her, and Nightwing says that they tracked the ping off of her phone before the call ended, and Audrey followed them. But as Nightwing is helping Melinda to her feet and they begin to walk out, it's Blockbuster that stops him. I am very disappointed to see this. Nightwing grabs his batons, telling him, I guess we're going through him. Blockbuster shouts out, There is no going through me! And he starts charging at them, a car crashing into him with Audrey opening the door. Everyone, get in! Brutal and Electrocutioner come out asking if everything's okay, but Nightwing helps Melinda in and Audrey drives away. Meanwhile, at the police station, 
a detective sits McLean down, telling him that he's never been a big fan, and he's more than happy to put him away. McLean folds his arms. Oh, I'm not going anywhere. There's a file on Blockbuster, and I'm not giving it to you unless you grant me full immunity. The detective tells him, so you'll turn the files over if you're promised protection? Yeah, and only if Maggie asks nicely. <sighs> well, that's a real shame, because that's not what Blockbuster wanted to hear. Without any hesitation, the man pulls out a gun and shoots McLean in the chest. Later, Melinda meets with Maggie, explaining that she was working with Blockbuster in secret. And Maggie says, Suppose I believe this. Why tell me? Melinda says because now Blockbuster knows that she is working against him. And she has something that he doesn't know that she has. She has paperwork on Blockbuster, and if they're going to take him down, they gotta do it fast. They have to act tonight. Maggie asks, how are they supposed to do that? She doesn't have enough cops that she trusts, and their chief witness was just shot. Melinda is stunned. McLean was shot? Probably because Blockbuster thinks that he has what we have. Maggie goes on stating that she doesn't trust anyone anymore. She's on her own here. And then a familiar voice tells her, no, you're not. As Melinda and Maggie step up onto the roof of the garage, Nightwing and Batwoman are standing there, and Nightwing says, it's good to have you in Bloodhaven. Superman spoke highly of you. As character references go, it doesn't get better than that. Nightwing then says that they have people. They'll do the work. They'll catch Maroney and Blockbuster's lieutenants in the act. All the police department has to do is be there and make sure that everyone is processed by the books. Maggie says that even if she wanted to, she doesn't know who she can depend on in the department. So Nightwing hands her Blockbuster's file. This is the list of every cop that has taken money from Maroney or Blockbuster. Maggie looks at the file. I get why you're here. So I'm trusting what you're saying, but I've made a mistake trusting Batwoman before. The two of them stare at each other for a moment and Nightwing steps in. I don't know what this is, but this city has been run by a corrupt and violent man. We have an opportunity to carry out the single biggest strike against organized crime that Bloodhaven has ever seen. Are you in? Tim, the Titans, and the rest of the Bat family all respond to the comms. Yeah, we're in. And Nightwing tells the family, thank you, seriously. Barbara then begins to lay out the plan, explaining that Blockbuster and Maroney have four major crimes planned for tonight. There's a shipment of arms coming into the Bloodhaven docks, a cargo plane trafficking people, and a few tons of very poorly made, very harmful substances being trucked in. And Boss Maroney himself will be at a rare jewels buy. If they take down Maroney and Blockbuster tonight, that will leave them in a position they can't recover from, which will give Commissioner Sawyer enough time to clean things up. As the time comes and each crime is thwarted, the calls come into Blockbuster and he calmly gets up from his seat in his penthouse, telling Brutal and El Executioner to come. We're going for a drive. They pull up to Haven and he pulls on an RPG. It's time to remind them who owns this city. This is my city. This is not their Haven. Back with the others, the cleanup and arrests all begin as Sawyer and her teams arrive. But before anyone can celebrate, Barbara radios in that they have a problem. Haven's been hit. Nightwing and Batwoman rush down as the buildings are burning. And Nightwing says that they have to evac everyone. He runs into the library where he sees a blockbuster already there with two children telling him to lose the sticks or he squishes them. Nightwing tosses his batons and blockbuster tells him, Good, now get on the floor, face down! Nightwing does as he's told, and Blockbuster releases the children and steps down on Nightwing's back. Did you really think that anything would change? I own the city! He then lifts up both fists, bringing them down with a thundering tomb. Nightwing lays there, in a crater created by the hit. Blockbuster looks down to see his mask have fallen off. And he realizes that Dick Grayson is Nightwing, and his anger only increases. Nightwing comes to with Blockbuster telling him, This entire time, I've been fighting against the city's most frustrating rat, and there was another pass behind the mask, like a Russian nesting doll of vermin. Nightwing places back on his mask, asking him, You think this is going to be easy? Perhaps not. I'll execution of Brutal. Merge in my location. Nightwing tightens his fist. Sounds like that'll take a few minutes. Good. More than enough time to take you down. He begins to knock Blockbuster back a bit, jumping over, grabbing his batons, and activating the taser function on both ends. He then uses them to give his hits a little extra effort. He tells Blockbuster that he's so sick of men like him. Men who could do anything, and they choose to hurt people. Men who have everything and still want more. The city deserves so much better than you. 
Blockbuster wrestles Nightwing off of him, shouting, This is my city! And Nightwing fires the grappling hook, latching onto Blockbuster. He pulls the cord tight, rushing in with both feet forward, kicking Blockbuster in the face, knocking the giant man over. Barbara, fully suited up, says, I just arrived. And Nightwing tells her, Don't worry about me. Take care of the evacuation. Haven's on fire! Barbara stops him. Actually, it's not. The people of Haven came together and they're helping put out the fires. Nightwing continues fighting against Blockbuster, telling her that it looks like Bloodhaven is putting out your fires. The city is fighting you, and they know everything about you. As Blockbuster is being beaten down, he calls out to Brutal and Electrocutioner, asking where are they. And just outside of the library, Barbara and Batwoman are stopping the both of them. Yeah, you're not going in. There's a private meeting going on behind these doors. Brutal tells the other thugs not to hesitate, but Barbara takes out a tablet, telling them, hang on. Sure, they can attack and not win, but before we all leap in, I have something that you should all definitely see. Back inside, Blockbuster grabs one of Nightwing's batons, crushing it. You are not the first in the city to try and stand up against me. After I'm finished here, I will break everyone who has ever helped Dick Grayson. Everyone who has ever known about you. Everyone that you have ever loved. I will find all of them. Nightwing coughs, asking, you think you know who I am? You don't know Nightwing. You don't know Dick Grayson. Because if you did, you would know that there's no way in hell either of us would allow you to hurt our friends. He launches himself forward with a kick that sends Blockbuster out of the library and into the street. To add insult to injury, the kids then throw a bucket of water on him, telling him that this place doesn't want him anymore. Blockbuster gets up and begins to run to his limo, telling Electrocutioner to open the door. But Electrocutioner stops. Actually, no. We know what you did. The hero showed us. You own Bloodhaven. I did two years there. It's the worst prison I've ever done time in. Two years of my life stuck in hell and it turns out it was all because of you. Blockbuster looks up into the driver's seat, calling out to Brutal. Tall tells him, nah. I had friends in Bloodhaven private that didn't survive the place. I don't work for you anymore and once word gets out, no one will. Good luck with your angry mob. He drives off with Electrocutioner making it very, very clear with the amount of obscenities that they don't work for him anymore. Later, once all the fires are put out, Barbara runs up the stairs to find Nightwing asking if he's okay. He tells her not really. Blockbuster knows who he is. Barbara, it won't be safe for us to be together. Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon can never be together. She looks at him for a moment. <laughs> Screw that! I love the part of you that wants to protect everyone, but this is one noble sacrifice I'm never going to accept. What about the danger? We're superheroes! We're always in danger, Dick! Darkseid could attack tomorrow. Kite Man could fall out of the sky at the wrong time. Trigon could step on me. I get that a storm could come, but we'll stand in it together. I'll even bring the umbrella. So I'm going to say something, and it's going to mean that you have to fight off a lot of Bruce's more toxic programming, along with your own stuff. But you're allowed to be happy. Frankly, so am I. Are you happy? With me? Nightwing looks her dead in the eyes. My life has been in constant danger for months. I've been shot at, beaten up, blown up. And I think this is the happiest I've ever been. Good. Let's keep going. Oracle and Nightwing, Batgirl and Robin, Dick and Babs. Forever. Nightwing tells her that it sounds pretty perfect. And she kisses him, telling him that he's worth dying for. But meanwhile, Elsewhere, Blockbuster runs through an alleyway when a shadow steps up in front of him. What cave wants their head caved in now? And Heartless responds, Bad day. How? I killed you. You did. But I got better. And your time is up. Heartless fires his heart-removing device, pulling out Blockbuster's heart. I had to modify the machine a bit since you're a bit oversized didn't want to clog the tubes. Your corrupt heart will still be the center of Bloodhaven. It will just be beating in my chest. This is my city now. With Blockbuster finally stopped, it's time to dismantle his empire across Bloodhaven, starting with one of his prominent figureheads, Salvatore Moroni. After being arrested and in jail for a while, Moroni didn't fully realize what was going on in the city. Specifically, he was unaware of the death of Blockbuster. But Blockbuster was a smart man. He kept details on everyone, including his own men, like spreadsheets of murders. 
When Commissioner Maggie Sawyer laid out all the evidence against Maroney, she reminded him how corrupt the BPD is. And should this information get leaked, he'd have a lot of unhappy mobsters. So without much of a choice, Maggie Sawyer does what she does best. And she tells him that they need to cooperate on what's in these documents so that they can bring down the operations before they have a chance to kill him. However, since they have an issue with protecting people, they will be getting a little help from Gotham City. Renee Montoya walks into the interrogation room, telling her that the deal they have is that they move tonight. They're going to be bringing Maroney to Gotham. Maroney asks, why would I be safer in Gotham? And Maroney tells him, because sadly, they know how to keep scum alive. Just look at the Joker. As the sun begins to set, Montoya places Maroney into an armored truck and begins to make her way back to Gotham, when suddenly a passing semi-truck plows into the side of them. The truck takes out a few police cars following, but worse yet, it rams into the armored truck, turning it on its side. Montoya checks to make sure that everyone is okay, and once she knows that they're all alive, she kicks open the back hatch to try and get away. But no sooner does she do that than her men step out. The criminals trying to kill Maroney open fire on her, forcing her to take cover. Montoya tells one of her officers to get Maroney out of there, but as the officer goes towards Maroney, he instead pulls a gun on him. But before he can pull the trigger in his scrimmage stick, clocks the corrupt officer as Nightwing and Batgirl pull up to offer support. Montoya looks at the officer. What the hell? And Maroney yells that her own man was about to put a bullet in his head. Montoya sighs. Can't even protect Maroney from her own people. Nightwing looks at her. No worry, I'll take him and keep him safe. Montoya asks him if he's sure, and Batgirl tells her, Yep, are you gonna be okay? Montoya tells her that she'll be fine. They want Maroney, not her. They'll meet on Monday. So Nightwing grabs Maroney, throwing him on the back of a bike, and begins to make off as Maroney is pleading to not be driven off on a motorcycle. He takes a shortcut, driving off the highway and into the woods that separates Gotham from Bloodhaven, passing Maroney off to Batgirl while he handles anyone that is following them. And right on cue, a group of men quietly make their way in search of Maroney. Too many people have walked into these woods and never walked out again, which makes it a great place to hide and an even better place to hunt. As the men are knocked out, Nightwing hurries up to one of the three bunkers that Batman has left in these woods, just in case he ever wants to brood remotely, which makes for a good place to stash a wanted criminal. After arguing for a little bit, Batgirl and Nightwing stick him with a tranquilizer, putting him to sleep. Batgirl explains that the Titans have agreed to look over Bloodhaven and Haley, three days in an isolated bunker in the woods with just Nightwing, Batgirl, and a known criminal. This is perfect. The next morning, Nightwing goes to check on Maroney to ask how he slept. Maroney says awful. The tranquilizer only lasted three hours, and this place has thin ceilings. He never thought about superheroes in relationships. And Batgirl asks, do you not spend any time on the internet? Nightwing says he's going to untie him, but don't try anything stupid. You're going to be stuck here for a few days, so let's not get off on the wrong foot. But before he can make his move, Batgirl says that they might have a problem. Nightwing peeks out the window and sees a taxi just sitting there, which is strange considering this bunker has no roads that even lead to it. Nightwing slowly walks up asking what's going on, and at that moment a man, who looks just like him, leans out. Name's Rick Grayson. You need to get into the cab now. Nightwing stares for a moment, confused. Rick, don't you recognize me? But then he remembers that he was Rick Grayson when he lost his memory. So whoever this Rick Grayson is, he might not have the memories of being Nightwing. You see, in what feels like a lifetime ago, Nightwing was shot in the head, and this caused a massive memory loss. He decided to rebuild his life in Bloodhaven as this character, Rick Grayson, becoming a cab driver. But that's long in his past now, and if he's here as Nightwing, then who is Rick Grayson? Nightwing gets into the cab, confused what's going on. He tells Rick that he can't go around looking like that. And this Rick person tells him, Right! Anonymity! One sack! With a puff of smoke, Rick turns into a younger Nightwing. Back to the era when Nightwing had his mullet and ponytail, and he asks him if this is any better. Nightwing sighs, No. Wait, what are you? With another puff of smoke, this time the figure turns into a small mini Nightwing. My name is Nightmite! Nightwing sighs. Oh, great, you're a fifth dimensional imp, like Batmite and Mr. Mixelpidilic. Nightmite flies up. Oh, you're so clever and charismatic and pretty. I can't believe that I'm meeting Nightwing in the flesh. Hopefully, I'm not interrupting this impromptu date weekend with a tied up mob boss. Actually, I'm on an impromptu date week with 
Batgirl then walks up. You have an imp! And Nightwing groans. Please don't find this entertaining. And Batgirl smiles. Too late. Nightmite flies at the Batgirl. Wow, Batgirl! I'd actually ship Nightwing with Starfire, but whatever makes him happy. Batgirl just looks at him. Excuse me? Speaking of which, will you, won't you, what's going on? And while we've clearly settled on yes you will, how about we get things started? With another puff of smoke, Nightwing and Batgirl are holding hands in a wedding attire, while other heroes are looking on. Batgirl screams out no, and Nightmite is confused, and Nightwing says not yet, and Batgirl says not yet? Nightmite tells them both, come on, what's wrong with happiness and commitment? We don't want to be like that guy, right? Denying yourself love, happiness, carbs. Nightmite snaps his finger, sending everyone away. But are we absolutely sure you don't want to see the dog? Haley then sits there with two rings. Batgirl says that Bitewing, as the ring bearer, is undeniably adorable, but they're sure. Nightmite snaps his finger, sending Batgirl inside, telling her fine. She can go back to guarding the mobster. We're running out of time anyway! In a flash, Nightwing is brought back to Bloodhaven as he asks why they're there. Nightmite tells him that Blockbuster may be gone, but he left trouble behind. Years ago, Blockbuster made a deal with the devil Neuron, which if he had greater intellect before he asked for it, you'd think he'd have the imagination to ask for a bit more. The upshot is he sold his soul. At some stage years later, he was able to renegotiate and instead of selling his soul, he sold his firstborn's soul instead. Her name is Olivia, and she's also one of Nightwing's biggest fans. Not as big as me, of course, but I'd invite her into my fan club. We even got shirts, see? It's Nightwing slapping Batman instead of that other guy. Anyway, with Blackbuster gone, Neron is coming to collect. He's sending a horde of demons from hell. Nightwing asks Nightmite, if you can alter reality, why can't you fix this? Because I'm not a hero like you, and I can't be involved directly. Neron is pretty serious when it comes to souls. I could be risking an all-out war between the underworld and the fifth dimensional imps, but you can. I'm just gonna give your weapons a bit of a boost. Don't worry, it won't kill the demons. You'll be sending them back to the underworld. And when the time comes, all you need to do is speak this phrase of power on your Eskrima sticks. Nightmite whispers the phrase and Nightwing tells him, you've gotta be kidding. Can't you make us something else? Nope, can't change it now. The demons are coming, it's time. Nightwing looks at Nightmite. Am I doing this alone? You're not gonna be alone, you'll have. Bitewing! Suddenly, Haley the puppy appears in a puff of smoke in her own costume, stating, Hunt now! Wait, she can talk now? Can talk. Thank you. Feed me. Save me. Nightwing pets her, telling her thank you. She's a very good dog. But as Nightmite is done fanboying over the site, Nightwing and Bitewing sneak into Blockbuster's former building when they suddenly hear the cries of the little girl. Nightwing rushes in, kicking the door open, telling the demons to get ready. The demons begin to fight back immediately, and Nightwing asks them to please don't make him say it. They are confused, asking what is he even talking about, so he holds his Eskrima sticks close and whispers, Nightwing is awesome. Suddenly the sticks glow with power, and Nightwing leaps into action. Within seconds, all four demons are sent back to hell. The remaining one grabs a hold of Olivia, telling him to stop or he'll break the little girl before turning her over to Neron. Nightwing tells her not to worry. I'm not gonna let the demon take you away. Everything's going to be okay. Olivia clenches her fist. I am going to be okay. And she punches the demon out of the building. Girl strong, Bitewing says, as Nightwing says that her father was too. Later, after making a call, Nightwing meets with Raven, who tells him, of course, she'll watch over Olivia. She can hide Olivia from Neron's gaze. Nightmite suddenly appears. Neron can't see? Raven just laughs. Ha, you have an imp. Oh, don't even start, Raven. Nightwing tries to tell her. Before leaving, Olivia tells Nightwing and Haley thank you, but Nightwing says actually... She should be thinking Nightmite. He's the hero here. I, I, I didn't do anything! But Olivia runs over hugging him. Thank you. And Nightmite hugs her back. It was my pleasure. As Raven disappears, Nightmite says, That was a night? You know, you're not like the other fifth dimensional imps that I've met. Thanks. I could see how annoying Batmite and Mixie can be. I didn't want to be that guy. I've been watching over you for years and learned a thing or two. What's your name then? And Nightmite is curious. Why would you want that? Nightwing tells him because Nightwing shouldn't be his whole identity. If he has impossible expectations of him, then at some point he's going to let him down. It's okay to be a fan, but he shouldn't put him on a pedestal. So how about I go first? Hi, I'm Dick Grayson. Nightmite takes the mask off. My name's Dixel. This is the greatest moment of my life. So this is gonna be a bit of an awkward transition. Speaking of deals with the devil, this city will need a new blockbuster, and it could very well be you. 
without the criminal empire, violence, corruption, and constant murder. Nightwing laughs. Thanks for clarifying. There's a hole in this city. There's a hole in this whole world, and honestly, you might be able to fill it. You know why? Why? Because Nightwing is awesome! The demon horde bows before their master, but Neron doesn't seem pleased. Tell me, he commands. The demons bow lower, explaining how they were defeated by the hero known as Nightwing and his super-powered dog. That they failed to acquire the soul of a nine-year-old girl, the daughter of Blockbuster. Neron cocks an eyebrow at them. A puppy? He questions, turning away, knowing that Nightwing has no powers. But he surrounds himself with powerful friends, including the daughter of Trigon, one of the most powerful demons in hell. I don't want to annoy Raven's father. We need earthly agents to recover the soul that is mine, Neron says. A short time later, he appears in the kingdom of Latvia, where the grinning man has taken the form of their king. What can I do for you? The grinning man asks. And after Neron declines to see the bodies that the new king has hidden away in his chambers, Neron offers the grinning man more time on earth before his soul is condemned to earth. All he needs to do is retrieve a girl and murder her. She is the daughter of Blockbuster. Her name is Olivia Desmond. Elsewhere, Olivia is racing through the woods, chased by a powerful sorceress who threatens to defeat her. There's nowhere left to run, the sorceress says as she corners Olivia. But Olivia is not alone, proclaiming that the kingdom is protected by her as she draws a magical sword. The Knight of the Realm and her mighty steed! She calls out as Garth appears at her back in the form of a green unicorn. Freaking nay, foul sorceress! He shouts. And Raven stares at her boyfriend. Excuse me, foul sorceress? Garth immediately begins to backpedal on his comment, explaining that he just got swept up in the game. Luckily, he is saved by the arrival of Nightwing and Bitewing, the puppy that Nightwing took in a while ago, and the dog rushes to see Olivia. Aw, she doesn't talk anymore? Olivia says as she hugs and pets the dog, and Nightwing smiles. No, I'm pretty sure that was a one-time thing. While Garth tries to figure out how the dog talked at all, Nightwing turns to Raven and questions her about the secluded house's defenses. The three heroes then head to the house while Olivia continues to play in the yard, Nightwing informing his friends that a body was recently discovered beneath the ruins of the Titan's Tower, and that the Titans are headed there to learn which of their students didn't make it out in time during Deathstroke's attack on Titan's Academy. Go, I'll look after Olivia, Garth tells his friends. So a short time later, the heroes all gather in New York, where the ruins of Titan's Tower lay. Starfire, who was the headmistress of the Academy, learns where the body is located beneath the rubble. The rest of the heroes push the police and construction workers back as she burrows beneath the rubble, lifting the building off of the body. She's desperate to learn which of her students they had left behind. Nightwing leaps down into the darkness with Raven, where they discover the body. Who is it? Do you recognize them? Starfire calls out, still worried that she failed her students. But Nightwing and Raven are shocked to discover the body of the King of Latvana. Okay, this makes no sense, Nightwing whispers. The heroes quickly remove the body so that Starfire can return the rebel to where it lay. A short time later, Amanda Waller arrives, angry with the heroes for disturbing the crime scene. Yeah, it was either that or dropped 20 tons of building back onto him. Nightwing explains, telling her that he thoroughly investigated the area and photographed the scene before they moved in on the body. I'll be happy to share all of my findings with whomever you need me to talk to, Waller. But she shakes her head, explaining that a special investigator has been sent from the Latvana Embassy to deal with the matter. A short time later, Nightwing stands in the morgue with the investigator and the body seems strange to him, as he explains that there are no dust or debris on it, meaning that it had been placed there after the building had fallen. The investigator also explains that the king had been seen in Latvana two days ago. Yeah, there's more to this, because the victim has been dead for weeks, Nightwing says quietly. And then he looks at the investigator who can't seem to stop grinning. Why are you smiling? He asks, and she shakes her head, turning away. I'm sorry. I know it's a bit inappropriate, but I like a good mystery. She says, with Nightwing apologizing for the country's loss, asking the woman if she'd ever met the king but that's when he's struck from behind and slams into the ground. I wouldn't say I knew the king, the grinning man says as his image shifts and he takes on the appearance of Nightwing. But I did meet him once, he says, looking down on the hero and continuing to grin. 
Later, one of the morgue cabinets is banging until it's finally popped open with Nightwing's a scrim of sticks. Oracle! He gasps as he finally frees himself. Over at their apartment, Barbara is cuddling with Haley in bed, the dog snuggling against her as she reaches for the comms, shocked to hear Dick's voice as he asks, where is Starfire and Raven? They're headed to Beast Boy's house. You're not with them? There's no way Raven and Starfire would have just left me. Something's wrong. I need Cyborg now, Dick tells her. Moments later, Oracle is relaying the message to Vic, and he boom tubes to the morgue. What's happening? I'm not sure, but I have a suspicion, and I think Olivia's in danger. As soon as we get there, find Raven, Beast Boy, and Starfire. I'll go after Olivia, Nightwing tells Vic as they boom tube to the house. Inside of Garth's house, Nightwing wakes Olivia, telling her that she is in danger, that they need to go. The sleepy girl takes the hero's hand as he leads her outside, but she's shocked to find Gar knocked out on the stairs. He'll be okay. They're after you, not him. Nightwing says as he takes her hand again, leading her into the woods. They duck undercover as Cyborg flies overhead. Isn't Cyborg one of your friends? Olivia asks, and Nightwing nods as they continue forward. Yes, but the person who's after you is a shapeshifter. He can be anyone, Nightwing tells her. That's the moment that a second Nightwing steps out of the trees, blocking their path. Yeah, that's what I thought, Nightwing says, raising his sticks. Olivia, stay behind me. This man's an imposter, the first Nightwing says, but the second Nightwing cocks an eyebrow at him. Am I? Name my dog. The first Nightwing doesn't answer, but the grin never leaves his face as he rushes to the real Nightwing who easily blocks the attack and hits him with stun pellets and a zap to the face. That the best you got? <laughs> the grinning man asks, but Nightwing then looks at Olivia. Olivia, I promise he's not me. I swear on Bitewing, he tells her. Olivia doesn't hesitate, punching the grinning man in the back, knocking him through the air, sending him through several trees. The powered assassin gets up on his feet. All right, seems like I was missing some information about you, girl. He rushes forward, grabbing her arm, leaping up and flying away into the air. But they're suddenly stopped by Raven, Starfire, and Cyborg. Everyone's staring at each other for a moment. Uh, I fly now, the grinning man says, still in the disguise of Nightwing. The heroes stare at him and sigh. Fine, clearly time to abort this mission, the grinning man says before tossing Olivia away, but none of the heroes move. Aren't you gonna, like... Catch her? The grinning man asks. Was hurling a little girl through the sky your entire escape plan? Cyborg asks. Meanwhile, a short distance away, Donna Troy is flying through the air with Olivia in her arms. The heroes hit the grinning man with a burst of energy, throwing him into the ground. With his disguise now fully gone, the assassin gets back to his feet, but the flash is suddenly there. You tried to run? Yeah, you don't get to run from this. Wally says as he punches the man in the face, knocking him out. It's later that the Grinning Man is now tied to a chair, where the Titans begin to question about how he got his powers and why he was after Olivia. He explains that he was once a really bad criminal who liked disguises. But he was approached by Neron, one of the Lords of Hell. Neron offered him powers for his soul, and the Grinning Man wanted to be powerful, able to fly, and a true master of disguise. And I wanted something to put a smile on my face, the Grinning Man says, but Neron was true to his word. The Grinning Man no longer had any features of his own except for the grin that never leaves his face. The heroes are shocked that Neron is even involved, and they move into another room of the house to discuss the matter. Why is Blockbuster's daughter so important? Cyborg questions, but Raven explains that Neron merely doesn't want to be seen as weak. That Olivia is merely the soul that is owed. I don't understand how an agreement with a father can be used against the daughter. I want to see that contract, Nightwing says. So Raven agrees, suggesting that they all break into hell. Excuse me? Garth gasps in disbelief, and Raven tells them that they can break into Neron's fortress to see the contract, while Donna and Starfire take Olivia to Themyscira for safety. Nightwing nods, looking at his friends. Then it's settled. The Titans are going to steal from hell. Later, a portal opens up, and the four heroes step into the abysmal landscape of hell. Welcome to hell. Raven tells her friends, and as the heroes press forward to Neron's fortress, Raven casts a spell that shields their eyes from the horrors around them. The place is full of suffering, and you're all heroes. You'll want to help. You can't help anyone. She tells them as they move. Above, Donna, Starfire, and Batgirl arrive on the island of the Amazons with Olivia, but the little girl is pouting, believing that she doesn't need all of them to protect her. Okay, well, we're not here for your protection, Batgirl tells her, and Donna nods, stepping forward. Nightwing tells me you're very strong. You want to learn how to fight? 
Donna asks, and Olivia jumps up and down, cheering. Oh my god, yes, please! She shouts. Meanwhile, down in hell, the heroes have arrived at Neron's fortress, led by Blaze, a demon who seeks Neron's throne and agrees to help the Titans. Nightwing decides that their best course of action is to sneak in. The four heroes quickly make their way to the top of the tower, where Cyborg finds all of his files are in computers from the early 90s. My god, this is hell, he whispers, but Vic manages to cut through the clutter and malware until he finally finds a folder on Olivia's soul. They move through the archives and find the glowing scroll, where they learn that Olivia's mother was Jezebel Jet. You know the name? Vic asks, and Nightwing nods, explaining that Jet was once one of the lovers of Batman. She was also murdered by Talia al Ghul. So that's it? Valid contract? Garth asks, but Nightwing shakes his head. No, I think I can get around it. We need bureaucracy, and I need to talk to my sister, Melinda. I think we can save Olivia's soul with the local government. Meanwhile, over at Iron Heights prison, the grinning man is sitting quietly in his cell, but Neron appears before him. You dialed? Do the Titans know of my involvement? The grinning man explains that he told them everything. Neron knows that he can't attack the Mascara outright, but he can send the Grinning Man and other villains whose souls he's trapped. So over on the island of the Amazons, the heroes are training Olivia to use her strength, but they're interrupted by Wonder Woman, who offers to spar with the young girl. Olivia, let's see what you can do, she says with a wide grin. At the other hero's urging, Olivia launches herself forward, punching Wonder Woman. But Diana catches the blow in her fist and leans in with a wide grin. I wasn't ready for you last time. You got a cheap shot in. Wonder Woman whispers, and she pulls the girl forward, kicking her hard, sending her bouncing across the fields. The other heroes all rush forward, but suddenly fall to the ground, clutching their heads. Psychic attack! Batgirl calls out. Wonder Woman's image begins to shift as the grinning man reveals himself, motioning over his shoulder as the ground shakes beneath them, and Dr. Polaris and Gorilla Grodd reveal themselves. Meanwhile, over at the Bloodhaven Town Hall, Nightwing is finishing up the paperwork when they get the alert about the attack on Themyscira. He tells his friends to go, he'll finish it up. Raven opens up a portal, and they all leave. Nightwing looks up as Neuron appears in the shadowy couch across the room. I thought Raven would never leave. He stands walking over to Nightwing. Doing some superheroic paperwork, Nightwing smiles standing, offering the paperwork to Neuron. Explaining that the contract for Olivia's soul is now invalid since it hasn't been signed by her legal guardian, which is now Nightwing. The Demon Lord sighs. Nightwing, if you let this go, we can come to an arrangement. He offers Nightwing anything that he wants, knowing that he desires the power to save humanity. So he waves his hand at the hero. Let me give you a taste of what I can give you. The power to change the world. In a flash of light, Nightwing is given superpowers as he floats into the air, feeling his new strength and abilities that flow through his body. Floating in the air, he looks down at his body. What have you done, Neron? He demands, but Neron merely explains that he has given Nightwing the power to change the world for two hours. You're a bright boy, you can do anything. I would remind you that your friends are under attack in Themyscira. Nightwing doesn't hesitate, flying away, crossing the world in a matter of moments. He arrives at the island, grabbing Gorilla Grodd, flying him to a deserted island so that his friends can continue the fight without the psychic attack. By the time he's returned, the rest of the Titans have beaten Dr. Polaris and the Gritting Man, and everyone looks up to Nightwing in surprise. Heh, <laughs> I fly now, he tells them with a smile, explaining to them the deal that Neron offered, and that he has two hours with the powers. Two hours? What are you gonna do? Garth asks him. With that, Nightwing heads out. He travels to see his friend, the Flash, and is finally able to keep up with his super speed. Any immovable objects you could use an unstoppable force for? Nightwing asks. Wally smiles, leading his friend to Bangkok, where they dismantle an illegal water capture and provide water to the thousands downstream. Next, Nightwing has a metropolis, where he flies up to meet Superman, offering his hand. Nightwing quickly explains his powers. I just wanted to say thank you and shake your hand. Superman proudly takes at shaking it. Good grip, he says with a smile, leading Nightwing into space so that the young hero can look down on the planet and see everything that they are protecting. Good to have this perspective, Nightwing admits, as Superman explains to him that the world is worth protecting against the threats from outside and in, that not everyone on the planet will always like everything that he does. I don't know, I'm pretty likable, Nightwing reminds him, but their talk is interrupted by Oracle, who warns him of another attack at Themyscira. 
Nightwing arrives during the battle, seeing Miron's demon horde attacking. He leaps in to beat a few demons and quickly grabs Olivia, flying her away to safety. In moments, they're flying over the mountains, but that's when Neron's voice calls out to him. That's far enough, hero. He snaps his fingers, instantly taking away Nightwing's power. Nightwing cradles Olivia in his body as they both fall out of the sky, landing hard in the snow. Looking up, Nightwing sees the Demon Lord standing over them, a glowing contract in his hand. That power can return. I will give it back. You have my word. Just give me the girl, Neron says, reminding Dick that it isn't even his soul that Neron is asking him to give up. But Nightwing refuses. Neron sighs in irritation. Do you not have a pragmatic bone in your whole body? With the power that I'm offering you, you can make the lives of billions better. Nightwing shakes his head, drawing his escrima sticks. I say, Nightwing is awesome. He says, activating the last of the magic powers that Night might left in the weapons. Go to hell, Neron. Nightwing says as he strikes the Demon Lord with the weapons, turning him into a massive tentacle beast that can barely move. Neron bellows in anger, disappearing, returning to the bowels of hell. Olivia rushes over to Nightwing, shocked that he would give up that power for her. It's okay. We'll look after the world just fine, he tells her. Later, the Titans stand on the beach of Themyscira where Diana offers Olivia a home on the island where she can be trained by Amazons. She accepts the offer, and Nightwing gives her a plaque, telling her that she is now an honorary titan. Until the day you can uh, step up and join us, of course, Garth reminds her. Olivia accepts with a smile, telling them that her superhero name will be Nightbuster, because she knows that combining Nightwing's name with Blockbuster would really piss her dad off. So the titans all wave goodbye as Donna leads Olivia to her new home and family. Thank you for saving me. Thank you. Olivia calls out to her friends. An hour later, Neron is hiding in his fortress, trying to pull his humanoid form back together, but he's interrupted as Raven stalks into his chambers. Nightwing beat you, she points out, and Neron shakes his head, telling her that it was merely one fight and he will win the war. Raven refuses to allow Olivia to live her life with the threat of a demon lord hanging over her head. She raises her hands, her dark magic swirling around her. I don't want hell, but I'm taking it away from you, she says as the magical energy expands and explodes through the fortress. As the smoke clears, Neron is collapsed to the ground. He's yours, Blaze, Raven calls over her shoulder. The female demon that helped from earlier steps into the throne world. And the underworld is yours until the next challenger, Raven says as she turns to leave. But Blaze stops her, pointing out that there is something wrong with Raven. I can feel it. I'm not sure what it is, but part of you is missing. Raven pauses for a moment, but she doesn't answer, stalking out of hell to return to the mortal world. And that concludes the Nightwing soft reboot that happened recently, and it now leads into issue 106, which we just covered, the Dawn of DC beginning. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Don't forget to check out the Problem With channel, the Manga Storian channel, and if you like the full stories of the rest of the comic story and full story collection. I'll see you next time.